one of the concerns that people have if you take a naturalistic or a scientific approach is that life becomes meaningless. And that's not true at all. Humans are really good at finding meanings in their life. To, to use the slogan, I, I put it, people, uh, people have three things that provide meaning, love, work, and play. So if you've got relationships with other people, if you've got meaningful, uh, challenging tasks that you can accomplish, and if you've got ways you can have fun, well, I think that's a perfectly meaningful life, and that's all that any reasonable person would want. You don't need God, and you don't need, you don't need intelligence somewhere else in the universe to think that your life is meaningful. I am really, really, really excited about cognitive science. I like how interdisciplinary it is. I like how empirically tractable it is. I like how many applications exist. If you're unfamiliar, cognitive science is an interdisciplinary space between philosophy, neuroscience, computer science, AI, psychology, and anthropology that tries to combine insights from across these disciplines to understand the nature of mind. Paul Vegard is one of the most interesting voices in this space. He has made important contributions towards understanding coherence, towards modeling cognition and emotions, and I think he has one of the most exciting theories of consciousness that's out there today. He has written several books, which I'll link down below, uh, two, including two upcoming ones, one on understanding the nature of balance and one on understanding misinformation. We talk about this and a whole host of issues across the study of mind and, and ethics and some questions of natural philosophy. This is my conversation with Paul Thaker. So um, tell me about the work on misinformation. Uh, I started on this because... I had a theory of information. And the way I came up with the theory of information was almost accidental. In 2019, just before everything shut down because of the plague, I happened in the same week to go to two different talks that were really interesting. One was by a, by a biologist, and the other was by my colleague, Chris Eliasmith, in theoretical neuroscience. And I noticed a real intersection between the two. And they were both making really important points about the importance of energy for understanding how information processing works. Uh, so I ended up writing a paper that I just published on energy requirements and their philosophical significance. But in the course of doing that, I realized that there isn't any good theory of information about there, it's out there. It's not a topic I thought about before, but especially the biologist was talking a lot about information. And so I went looking for a good theory of information. And there's an old one going back to Claude Shannon, which treats it as a kind of measure using probability theory, which has been very useful for some purposes in communication, uh, but it doesn't apply generally to the kind of information that goes on when we talk about people being human information processors. That's a way in which psychologists have talked about the mind ever since the 50s, when the behaviorist ideas were tossed aside because they couldn't explain enough about how human beings, human beings behave. Instead, the idea of an information processor uh, but what's what it, what's information? It's not just the probability measure that Shannon used. It's got to be something that's got meaning. It's got more, much more a substance to it that can correspond to the world. Uh, and I looked through a bunch of recent sources on information, and none of them seemed to have an answer to that question. So I asked myself, well, what would a theory of information be? So here, a background in philosophy of science is useful, because what's a theory? Well, sometimes theories are mathematical expressions, you give a set of differential equations in fields like physics or economics, and those are very useful. But a lot of other theories in fields like biology and medicine and cognitive science are descriptions of mechanisms. So many philosophers of science, Bill Bechtel, Carl Craver, Lindley Darden, and I have been arguing for the last couple of decades that important theories in these fields are descriptions of mechanisms. So I asked myself the question, well, what would a theory of information be if it was a matter of mechanisms? And very quickly, I generated eight mechanisms. I won't run through the list right now, but they fall into four general categories. One is a, a acquiring information from the world. The second is inferring, then making conclusions that go beyond what you see in the world. The third is memory, because you want to store information and retrieve it. And the fourth is spread, and then because you want to spread information between people. So it seemed to me that. It, my eight mechanisms fell onto these four headings, which gave a mechanistic theory of information. And so I managed to slide that into the last draft of the paper before it got published in the journal Philosophy of Science. But then I think what happened was the pandemic. 
Because if you remember in February, two years ago, suddenly the pandemic hit and drew everyone's attention. And suddenly people were complaining vociferously about misinformation because there was so much nonsense coming out, even right from the beginning, of what the source was, that this was some kind of Chinese conspiracy. And so suddenly the word misinformation was was in the air. It had been around for several years before that because there had been lots of accusations of misinformation against Trump and so on. But I think it was the pandemic that got me thinking about misinformation. So now, since I had a theory of information, the question is, how do you apply that to misinformation? And here, I drew on another piece of my philosophical background in philosophy of medicine. Uh, so what's, what's a disease? Uh, so if you explain health by looking at the mechanisms that support health, so what keeps you uh, healthy? It's because your heart mechanism is working and your lung mechanism is working. And so you can explain health by all the biological mechanisms are working well. But then what's disease? Well, way back in the 90s, I argued what a disease is, is a breakdown in the mechanisms that support health. So a disease happens, you get heart disease if your heart stops working, if the valves, for example, are damaged. Uh, you get uh, uh, an infectious disease if the infection stops your lungs from working or your throat from working. Uh, so the idea here is that a disease is a breakdown in the mechanisms that support health. Well, that suggested to me the analogy that misinformation results from breakdowns in the mechanisms that support information, that support real information. So I started to look for what are the ways in which these different mechanisms for information can break down? And so that almost immediately generated a theory of misinformation. There are lots of complaints about misinformation out there, people like the Surgeon General in the U.S. have been complaining about how the whole health process is being distorted by misinformation. Of course, there's lots of political problems, too. But then I had a theory of information that generated quickly a theory of misinformation. So what I do in the book is show how this theory of what real information is based on a set of identifiable mechanisms and what misinformation is based on breakdowns in those mechanisms can explain what's gone horribly wrong in many different cases that arise today. So there's a chapter on COVID-19 and all the misinformation about that. Uh, there's a chapter on climate change because, well, this has been a problem for decades now is that good science has developed all sorts of real information about the threats of climate change, but lies have been promulgated by politicians and by uh, oil companies, because they don't want anything to stop their very successful activities. So climate change is another big area. The third one I decided to do was conspiracy theories. Uh, so conspiracy theories abound. You heard the horrible killing in Buffalo this week. Uh, and that was really prompted by a conspiracy theory. It's misinformation about conspiracies that don't exist. So the killer in the Buffalo murders uh, had read all sorts of stuff about how it's called the Great Replacement Theory. It's the idea that there's a conspiracy to get rid of, of, uh, of white people and in order to allow black people and immigrants to take over the country. It's a ridiculous, ridiculous theory. And of course, in some versions of it, it's, it's organized by the Jews who often figure in conspiracy theories. So I've got a chapter of conspiracy theories, and I show how my distinction between real information and misinformation applies very well to what's going on there. So that's three applications. The fourth application is to inequality. This one isn't talked about so much, but I think it's really important because there are many arguments being given to say that inequality is real and justified and it's used to hold people down. It's used to justify all sorts of discrimination against, uh, against women, against uh, uh, racial minorities, against immigrants. Uh, and so I go through ways in which misinformation about inequality is done. The final application is one that just happened because of the horrible events in Ukraine. So to sum everything up, I wanted to produce a misinformation manual, which is a set of instructions about how it is that we can deal with misinformation. But to illustrate it, because this has been in the news so much over the last three months, I used the example of misinformation in the Russia-Ukraine war. Because right from the start, Russia, which has been an incredible producer of misinformation over the last well, more than a decade, started telling lies about Ukraine. 
lies that Ukraine is ruled by neo-Nazis or there's large neo-Nazi forces there or that Ukraine is really part of Russia historically. Uh, and so I use that as providing more and more examples and I use them to illustrate what I call a manual for dealing with misinformation. So that's how the misinformation book is developing. Right. Okay. Before we get into the manual, uh, this idea of focusing on the mechanisms explaining a phenomena rather than looking for uh, necessary sufficient conditions or trying to pin down definitions uh, seems to be a thought that that's consistent throughout your work. Uh, so th tell me a little bit about how that developed. Yeah, so it's kind of sad that still there are a lot of philosophers trying to do philosophical analysis by giving definitions. Uh, it's really bizarre because there's huge amounts of both philosophical arguments and empirical uh, evidence to, to think this is just the wrong way to go. In philosophy, the idea that we shouldn't be looking for definitions goes back to very influential philosophers like Wittgenstein, which is language games idea, and Hilary Putnam, who argued back in the 70s, we shouldn't look for definitions, we should look for stereotypes. And this work has been very compatible with lots of psychological evidence that suggests that the classical definition of the sort of the classical theory of, of concepts is involving definitions. It's just wrong. And there's lots of alternatives that have come out of psychology. Um, so that, that's just simply a, a bad way to do philosophy. It's just really sad that there's still industries that try to employ it, usually by making up thought experiments and thinking that the fact that you make up a little story provides evidence for some conclusion that you draw from it. But you know, it's, still, it's still popular. Um, but I came out of a background in philosophy of science, where you look at what you learn from science and how it operates. And I think probably the first philosopher to emphasize the role of mechanisms in science was Wesley Salmon, uh, because he noticed that the logical positivist view that you should be able to give a kind of logical account of how science works wasn't, wasn't right. Lots of people, other people had noticed that, but as an alternative, he mentioned, well, consider explanations as providing mechanisms. And since then, that idea has been developed by a bunch of different philosophers that I've mentioned. I started doing it in the 90s because of work in philosophy of medicine, but William Bechtel was even earlier in doing that kind of work. And since then, people like Carl Craver and Lily Darden have written really good books and lots of articles that spell this out. So the idea here is that to understand what's going on in the field, look for mechanisms rather than definitions. This is, is, of course, the way scientists often think. I got into this not by reading actually the philosophical literature, but by the fact that I got interested in the new theory of ulcers in the 1990s. I was writing about that, so I was reading lots of works in microbiology and gastroenterology, and they kept talking about mechanisms. And I was like, what? what, what why are they talking about mechanisms? Because I didn't have it. I'd read Salmon. And I'd read Bechtel, but they hadn't really registered with me. What puzzled me was, well, why are these people talking about mechanisms? It started, and I gradually realized it was really important because they were interested in mechanisms by which infectious diseases infect people and, and give them ulcers, for example. And they're interested in ways in which medications like antibiotics can work to disrupt those mechanisms. So it was back in the 90s I got convinced of the importance of mechanisms, and that's really only increased since then. Um, so that's why I was inclined when I first started thinking about information was to look for the mechanisms. Definitions usually don't take you anywhere. Right. The, the, the dividing line seems to be naturalist, uh, naturalist philosophy or more traditional forms of analytical philosophy, where you, if you were to take science more seriously in explanation, I think you tend to move away from that kind of definition. Yeah, you, you certainly, if you look at scientific literature, it's amazing if you do a Google search for a Google Scholar search for the word mechanism, you get hundreds of thousands of cases, even just in a small amount of time. And uh, Lily Darden in one of her papers estimates that something like 10% of, of scientific abstracts use the word mechanism. So mechanism is ubiquitous in science. You find it in, uh, in all the natural sciences and quite a few of the social sciences. And so that's the way scientists often talk. And I think it's a useful way for philosophers to talk as well. Right. Right. Um, so are you are you strictly a naturalist? Uh, yes, I'm a kind of uh, <laughs> absolutist naturalist, I suppose. Uh, what are the alternatives? The alternatives is suppose that somehow you can understand reality by looking at what's supernatural, by thinking about 
uh, thinking about supernatural beings like gods, or by looking for supernatural entities, which are not, which are sometimes proposed by philosophers who aren't theological. But if you start talking about abstract propositions or concepts as like platonic forms, that is, they're abstract things that exist independently of people's thinking about that. I think these kinds of supernatural entities aren't at all important for explaining what really matters about philosophy, namely the difference between knowledge and and falsity, the difference between reality and making things up, the difference between right and wrong. All of these fields, the key fields of philosophy, can be done in naturalistic form. I showed that most uh, pervasively in my book, Natural Philosophy, which came out in 2019, where I make a really strong general argument. Now, of course, naturalism has always been part of philosophy. Go back to Thales, and Thales probably was the first philosophy, at least in the philosopher, at least in the Western tradition, and he was also one of the first scientists. And so for the him, science and philosophy went together as they did for Democritus and did for Aristotle. So naturalistic approaches have always been part of philosophy. But often they haven't been as popular as the more supernaturalist approaches that Plato took and theologians took and uh, Frege took, if you move into one of the major uh, forces behind modern day analytic philosophy. It's the idea that you should be able to proceed in philosophy as you do in mathematics or as you some people think you proceed in mathematics by a priori means, by just thinking things out. Um, so I think that the just thinking things out approach that's been dominant in analytic philosophy and in, uh, and in mathematics is not, is not a good approach to philosophy, which can do much better by tying in very closely with what we learn through empirical approaches like science. Right. And it seems like when people People have an easy time accepting that with most natural phenomena, but when the natural phenomenon becomes personal, that's where it seems like you can interject with just ordinary language, uh, talking about the mind in any instance or social political phenomena in any instance. Well, part of that's because the understanding of the mind by science has taken a long time. I mean, there was good physics and biology and uh, chemistry by the 19th century, but understanding the mind is much more recent. It really only started scientifically in the late 19th century. Uh, and so, and even today, there are lots of puzzles about psychology that are hard to address. The biggest one, of course, is consciousness. I think it seems that you can, some people think you can learn more about consciousness just by introspecting, by paying attention to your own your own feelings. And I think you can learn some things there. But the wonderful thing that's happened now, I think, in cognitive science, combining psychology and neuroscience and other fields, is we're starting to get much better understanding of even the most difficult problems, such as consciousness and emotions. So I think this makes it really exciting time to be a natural philosopher, a naturalistic philosopher, because there is all sorts of data about how the brain works and about how minds work to feed into much better theories of mind that deal with the classic philosophical worries about consciousness and, and emotions, but now we can do it in a way that's continuous or interconnected with science. Yeah. I mean, it, it makes total sense when you think about it, right? Like, why would you be able to have, say, introspective thoughts about how your mind works and not introspective thoughts about how your heart works? You have to take axiomatic that they're both natural in the same sense. Well, it's not an axiom. It's like it's something that has to be, it has to be established. And so you can't actually introspect about your heart. Like you can notice your heartbeat, but until you dissect it and figure out the mechanisms, you don't know how it is that the valves are pumping uh, that, that, that in order to get blood through the rest of your body. That, that requires empirical study. But people have long had the illusion, again, going back to Plato, that you can think about, you can learn about thinking just by thinking about it. And of course, that's a good start. You learn a lot by paying attention to your thoughts. I think it's important to realize that we've got conscious experiences that include our external senses like vision and smell. We've got internal senses like pain and heat. We've got emotions. We've got hundreds of different emotions. And we've got abstract thoughts. I, I think for now, I'm consciously aware that I'm having an interesting conversation with you. And so these are, these are four different kinds of, of conscious experiences that we can observe, but we can't explain them. We, we can't explain them just by observing them. We want to know what's behind it. And of course, historically, the main dominant view coming out of religion is what's behind it is some kind of supernatural uh, agent, namely the soul. Uh, so it was easy to suppose that people have souls that's doing all that thinking, all that conscious experience. But now 
We've got wonderful alternatives to that because we're learning more about how the brain works. And so we can identify the brain mechanisms that produce consciousness. So this is really time for, uh, conscious, for, for naturalistic philosophy to blow the alternatives out of the water. Right, right. Um, yeah. The, do you think, just to, on the other side of that, do you think there is a role for philosophy to explain phenomenal experience in phenomenal terms? Well, no, because anybody, anyone, anyone can introspect. Um, so the phenomenology is important. I don't reject that because you do learn about the, your own mind by observing what you're doing, what you're experiencing. But that doesn't provide explanations. For explanations, we need, need to go deeper. We need to go into we need to go into abstract metaphysics and talk about the soul. But we can do much better if we go into a scientific approach and look at the biological mechanisms. So that is right now the question you might wonder. This is this is one that's always raised. Well, then why do we need philosophy? Why do we need philosophy? Because we got science. And so people have and this this worries goes back to Frege and back to uh, Husserl. If if we if we just look at science, then philosophy is gone. It will be out of the job. Well, there are, are hardly any jobs in philosophy, so that's not really the question now. But does philosophy have a have a have a have a position? I think it's got a really important position. I published an article that's uh, been fairly widely read called uh, "Why Cognitive Science Needs Philosophy and Vice Versa," uh, because I was defending uh, philosophy against the view that once we have cognitive science, we don't need philosophy anymore. And actually, some scientists have this view, even some, some cognitive scientists. So philosophy is just um, j just an extra add-on that we really don't, don't need. Uh, I think Richard Feynman said that uh, uh, philosophy, scientists need philosophy like birds need ornithology. Right. <laughs> it's, and so, but I've got responses to that in that article on why cognitive science needs philosophy and vice versa. And what are the responses? Well, I think there are two important things that philosophy does that show that it's different from and makes an important contribution to science. They are general, generality and normativity. So the generality is philosophers ask much broader questions. Uh, some scientists ask them, but normally scientists are consumed with pretty local questions. So if you're an expert on COVID-19, you're studying the way the virus works, you're studying its progress in people. It's so pretty narrow questions about how bodies work and how the disease works. But philosophers, I think quite usefully, ask much more general questions. They ask questions like, well, what is a disease? What is health? What is an explanation? And I think these are wonderful questions. In cutting edge science, they crop up. Because if you're at the cutting edge of physics or biology or cognitive science, you have to start worrying about these questions because it all gets up in the air. And most science don't work at the cutting edge, and so they can proceed without worrying about them. But these are questions that are important for science. They're important for thought in general. So I think it's really useful that philosophers can step back and look not just at one little area of science, and not even just to one science, but look at a bunch of sciences and see what are explanations, what are theories, what is health, what is disease, and address these big general questions, which I think are really important. So that's the first thing that I think philosophy does, and, and often it does it very well. I and mean, there's lots of good people doing natural philosophy these days. Uh, it may even be the dominant approach. I'm not sure. I haven't done a poll. But there's certainly lots of good ways of doing philosophy of science. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, think, I think Kang Yin Yang pointed out, um, the 20th century philosopher of science, that science doesn't have great mechanisms to answer to pose questions. It has great mechanisms to answer questions. It has methods. But at the at the edges, there's nothing in a scientific paradigm that suggests what to ask next, whereas philosophy has those tools. Well, it can certainly be useful there, but even with questions that are already on the table, it asks more general questions right. that cross the sciences and cross different fields within a science. So it's got both those advantages. But I mean, quite often, scientists are pretty good at generating their own questions, uh, but they're not good at generating the general questions that are in fact the background of what they do. So philosophy, I think, is really useful for generality. The other thing philosophy is really useful for is normativity, questions of good and bad and right and wrong. And of course, this has been part of philosophy going back to Plato and Aristotle and ancient Chinese um, philosophy as well. So we're concerned with not just how things are, but how they ought to be. 
Now, sometimes scientists do get involved with these questions when they're doing applied science. If you're doing dealing with education, for example, you're concerned with how to get people to learn better or bridges. Of course, you want to be better rather than worse. But most of the time, science doesn't have to worry about the normative questions. But one of the strengths of philosophy is that the normative side of it is through and through. So in epistemology, you're concerned about not just what people believe, but when their beliefs are, beliefs are true or false. Or in ethics, you're concerned not just with how people behave, but whether their behaviors are immoral or moral or bad or good. And so philosophy has got now a couple of millennia of experience in addressing these questions. And obviously there's lots of disagreement, but I think there's been some real progress too. So I think scientists, when they get involved in practical affairs and if you look at something like COVID-19, it's just full of normative questions. How should we inform people? How should we control their behavior? How do we balance trade-offs between uh, allowing people freedom and keeping them from killing each other? And so these are these are phil- these are ethical questions, they're philosophical questions, and philosophy has uh, a great history of dealing with them. So that's why I think normativity as well as generality are the two key things that make philosophy different from normal empirical science and make it incredibly valuable to science, but also to concerns of how people live their lives, to questions of politics and economics and everything about human society. So some, because I'm such a, a naturalist, some people think, well, I've, I've somehow gone away from philosophy, but I can honestly say that over the 50 or so years that I've been studying philosophy, my appreciation of the value of it has only increased because I see the value in dealing with these questions as being just increasing all the time. And so the two of my misinformation book with lots of, of naturalistic mechanisms in it, but I'm, in all these cases dealing with seriously general and normative questions, and you can't do that without philosophy. What you need is philosophy and science working together. I don't like Klein's metaphor that philosophy and science are continuous because continuous suggests that they're on the same sort of, it's much better for me to think of them as interacting mechanisms. That is, there's a, a, a uh, interconnections there that are much more uh, much more productive than merely thinking the two fields as being continuous. Right. And I think, it, at least my experience of reading philosophy, if you go before the 20th century, it is a bit difficult to try to separate the two, to separate natural, philo- natural philosophy and, and philosophy, or ordinary language philosophy. Well, it depends which philosophers you look at. So that's certainly true of the British empiricists uh, and Hume, especially. And so they were aware of the science of the day and they took it, took it quite seriously. But of course, there's lots of a priori approaches to philosophy too. Take especially religious philosophers like Aquinas. They think the real truths there are coming from religious texts or from pure reason. Uh, or Kant actually rebelled against what uh, Hume's naturalistic approach and he tried to come up with a priori proofs. I think he utterly failed, but that still was a very popular approach to philosophy. But certainly lots of, of, of great philosophers, people like Locke and Hume and others were, were aware. And actually even Kant knew, was thoroughly knowledgeable about um, uh, science of his day. And even Hegel, who's often uh, criticized for being uh, so a priori, actually knew the science of the day as well. So it used to be that philosophers had to know the science of the day and not just know it, but to a large, to a, a fairly large extent, use it. But that hasn't always been true in the 20th century. Yes, there are three stages of the manual, things that I think we can do if we want to deal with the kind of misinformation that we find in health, politics, uh, military affairs, all these sorts of things. So the first thing we need to do is to distinguish misinformation from real information. I mean, that's before you can deal with the misinformation, you've got to spot it. And I provide a detailed way to do it based on the theory that I told you about, the theory that's based on these four general processes of acquiring, inferring, memory, and spread. And so we can look at way differences between real information and misinformation looking at these different processes. So start with acquiring. I go into a lot of detail. Part of this is drawing on philosophy of science on how 
good science comes up with real information. So part of it is just by observation. We can use our senses. That's not, that's important. Um, we can also use instruments. So a big part of what science does is use instruments. So we're able to use thermometers, for example, to take people's temperature. We're able to use microscopes to see different kinds of, uh, so there's lots of instruments that can be used that are part of coming up with real information. And when they, when scientists want to go beyond their experience, they use mod, mod, kinds of inference that are really reliable. In philosophy, it's usually called inference to the best explanation. So you can go beyond what you observe by coming up with theories such as the germ theory of disease that explain what you observe. Um, so this is how scientists do it, and that's how you get real information. And you're careful about how you store information, and you're careful about how you spread it. Okay, so, that, so scientists, for example, have to go through publications and referee journals. It doesn't guarantee that it's true, but it makes it much more likely than if someone just talks about it. But what about misinformation? You can look at the ways in which all these mechanisms go wrong. And the biggest way in which they go wrong is by a process that I give the name making stuff up. <laughs> so if you look at what Donald Trump does, or if you look at what all these people advocating for the white replacement theory, um, it, they're just making stuff up. They got no evidence. They've got nothing acquired by observation or by instruments or by controlled experiments. They just make stuff up. And so if you simply have your eyes peeled to see is that claim the result of interactions with the world through instruments or experiments or observations, or is it just made up? The answer should jump out at you. 90% 90, 90 of what Donald Trump says is just stuff that's made up. Okay, so that's the first part that goes into my manual is distinguish between misinformation and real information. The second part is what I call a toolkit for reinformation. I made up a word. So we know what real information is information that's true. Misinformation is information that is false or misleading in various ways. Uh, disinformation is misinformation that's an intentional lie. The person saying it knows that it's wrong. Uh, so the question is, how do we turn misinformation and disinformation into real information? Well, that's a process that I call reinformation. I made up the word to mean that we're trying to recover or restore or basically fix the, the misinformation that's there. So how do you do that? Well, the toolkit has a bunch of things. So first of all, you've got to identify the misinformation. The second thing you can do is look at the sources. So it's always really important to figure out who are the sources of information. So if it's coming from Donald Trump or Fox News, there's a really good chance that it's just wrong. So you want to look at the sources. Uh, but then how, do, how, can you, how can you fix it? Well, then you have to follow a number of different strategies or techniques that I described. One of them is critical thinking. This is the sort of thing that philosophers have been teaching for, I don't know, 100 years. I used to teach critical thinking for many years at the University of Waterloo. And I think when done well, these critical thinking courses are really useful. They basically have two steps. This isn't always how, how it's always done. Sometimes people teach critical thinking as basically informal logic, which I actually don't think is, is very useful. But uh, you can teach it as a, a two-step process where, first of all, you figure out where did people go wrong? And you can do that in terms of what philosophers call fallacies or what psychologists call biases. I think there's long lists of either of them, and they're very useful. I think the most important thing that leads people astray is a process that psychologists call motivated reasoning. It's the idea that instead of looking at the evidence, people are gone astray or led astray by their personal motives. Uh, so for Donald Trump, he doesn't care about evidence. He only cares whether a particular claim is in his interest or not. If it's in his interest, he'll say it. That's motivated reasoning to extreme. Most people aren't quite that extreme. Usually what most people do is we don't want to completely make things up, but we bias our look at the evidence based on what we want to believe. So, for example, um, if uh, someone who's a heavy smoker will say, oh, I'm, smoking is not that dangerous, I'm, and they'll find some odd study that say that it's okay. So that's motivated reasoning. That's a big part of the first stage of critical thinking, which is identify the thinking areas that people are making, identify the biases or the fallacies that occur. The second stage is to correct them. And to correct them, you need to know logic in the informal sense. Deductive logic isn't very useful because people don't make that many 
mistakes in deductive logic, but you definitely need to understand inductive reasoning, understanding how to generalize from a sample to a general conclusion, how to do inference to the best explanation, which gives you theories which go beyond what you observe to explain what's going there. Things like theories of bacteria and viruses. Um, so you want to have as a second stage of critical thinking. But critical thinking isn't the only way to do this. I've got several other techniques that I think are useful for what I call reinformation, that is fixing misinformation. One of them is more straightforward, it's just factual correction. If someone makes a claim that's just obviously false, it doesn't need critical thinking. If someone says, oh, people who get vaccinated die right away. Well, wait a minute, you can just look at the facts and see that no, vaccinations don't kill people right away. The more complicated one, and this is something I've only learned about in the last year, is a technique that comes out of psychology called motivational interviewing. Now, most people won't know about that outside of psychology, but it's turned out to be a really useful way for dealing with addiction. It's basically a kind of short-term psychotherapy dealing with addiction. So, for example, if someone uh, is an alcoholic, that is, they're drinking so heavily that it's destroying their families, it's ruining their career, well, they obviously need help. And you might try to apply them with logic. You might have tried critical thinking. Let's look carefully at the pluses. And, well, but it doesn't work because people who are addicted don't follow logic all that well. A motivational interviewing is a kind of therapy technique that's been used. It's aimed much more at empathy rather than logic. You try to understand people, why they're coming from, why are you drinking so much or so on? Or why, how, how do you understand how it's affecting you? And so it's a much more general uh, therapeutic way of trying to get people to change their behavior and change their minds. Uh, well, it's recently been suggested that this might work for misinformation as well. And I don't know whether it does, because it's hardly been tried. There's maybe one small study that does it for anti-vaxxers. So if you've got a parent who said to their child, I don't want to have my children vaccinated because vaccinations are bad. Well, the logic view would say, well, what reasoning errors are you making and how can we correct it? Motivational interviewing is much more sympathetic and, and much more empathetic and much more empathic. It tries to get at, why do you have that belief? Who, who, where did you read this? What are you worried? And especially, what are you worried about? Because most anti-vaxxers within the, within the, at the family level aren't bad people. They're really parents who are concerned about the health, the health of their children, as all good parents are. Uh, so they're not, they're evil anti-vaxxers, but that's not true of most of these, of the, most of the parents are doing it. And so you use this sort of much more gentle technique of getting at what's bothering them, at what they're really worried about, and use that as a way of inclining them much more gently toward realizing that no, vaccinations are good for their children and for themselves and for society. So motivational interviewing. I think deserves a much better look as a way of correcting misinformation. The last way I've talked about, which I think is important in lots of these cases, is political action. It comes to a point where you can't convince individuals. You're not going to convince Donald Trump of anything. You're not going to con con convince uh, uh, some of the people on Fox News of anything. They're just making huge amounts of money by saying views that get them a certain audience. Uh, and so they're not convincible. You can't convince people who are sending out all sorts of false messages on Trump, on, on Twitter. Um, so what you need to do instead is find ways of using the political system, using elected governments to control their behaviors. And so I think we need major changes in the way that the internet operates. The internet is a major source of misinformation. That's true of all the areas that I've mentioned, of the replacement theory in politics, COVID-19 nonsense, climate change, this information, that's probably the most serious because that's the one that 50 years from now could turn the world into a nearly uninhabitable place. But all of these are kinds of misinformation that need to be dealt with, not just at the individual level, but actually at the political level where we get control over the internet and other sources so that it, they work in the favor of real information that serves the real interests of people. Yeah. I mean, that that's a wonderful approach from cognitive psychology that when a mechanism breaks down, like the information mechanisms, it, it doesn't work just to say, well, fix it, right? Reason correctly or, or think correctly. Uh, it's to look for a mechanism that can intervene and fix the problem. That's right. And so these are just ways of, of fixing broken mechanisms. Uh, but, the, but they're not obvious. I have motivational interviewing. I taught critical thinking for, uh, for a long time, and uh, I didn't know about motivational interviewing. 
uh, as a way of getting people to move away from false beliefs. Um, and I never thought so much about the political side either, but once you realize that the extent of misinformation in the world has increased dramatically in the less than 20 years that we've had social media, because with social media, like Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, they allow people to get access to millions of people instantaneously. And so the problem has changed. The problem has become way worse than it ever was before. There's always been misinformation, but never at the magnitude that there is right now. And it's causing serious problems. If you look at the U.S., for example, the U.S. just had its millionth death in, uh, from COVID-19. And there were going to be deaths, obviously. It's a very serious disease. But Canada, uh, the death rate is about a third was in the U.S. And a lot of it is because uh, in the U.S., the information sources got swamped so that uh, ridiculous views about the dangers of vaccines became dominant. So to put it simply, misinformation kills. And to stop it, you need critical thinking, but you also need motivational interviewing. And I think, frankly, you need political action to keep the internet from being so powerful at giving people the accessibility of, of ideas that can kill them. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough question. Like, Do you ever think about where that line is between the other strategies and political action? Because the climate crisis, for example, it just seems that it's it's so existentially serious that I I don't blame a lot of people, especially activists who are in the front lines of dealing with it, from from getting upset and kind of giving up on trying to change minds and focusing solely on whatever action delivers the most consequence. Well, you've got to do both because I, I want a democratic solution to this. I don't want to. Sol- yeah. So I want people to realize that climate change is a really serious problem. So I want to work on convincing the individuals so they will vote to leaders for leaders who will do the right thing to start to to deal with it at the broader level. For example, by imposing uh, new laws to make there be less wild spread of misinformation on the Internet. So you know, I think you need both. And if you think, think of me- the medical analogy is useful here quite often. The best thing to do with a serious disease like cancer is a bunch of different kinds of treatment. And so you can try different drugs. You can try uh, not just chemotherapy. You can try radiation. You can try um, you can try surgery. You can try improved uh, health procedures. These are all the things that could work together. So I think we need a whole bunch of ways of, of addressing misinformation. Um, the third part of my manual uh, that I just really thought about for the first time, which I think is really useful. I I had to make up another word for this as well. I call it pre-information. It's the idea that we want to have something like preventive medicine. So preventive medicine is really important because you don't always just wait till disease happens. It's much better if you can prevent the disease in the first place. If you think, for example, of cancer, cancer is really hard to treat, but if you have a healthy diet and if you exercise and you don't smoke and you avoid uh, toxic air, you can dramatically lower your chances of getting cancer. And so that's really valuable. So that's preventive medicine. So we want something like preventive information, which I call preventive, pre-information. And so I've got a number of suggestions about how to do this. One is just to reduce people's gullibility. I mean, people, people are frankly often too gullible. They, they are, they're too ready to believe things. Uh, it's been attributed to Spinoza. I'm not sure he said this. That he said he said that uh, people believe what they're told. That that's the default. In fact, I don't know if Spinoza said that, but certainly some contemporary psychologists have noticed that by and large, if somebody tells you something, uh, you believe them. So if you're um, asking someone, "Where's the tr- streetcar stop?" and they say, "Oh, it's over there," well, even though you don't know this person, you're usually going to believe them because by and large, people tell the truth. But once you're in the era of misinformation, you simply have to become more gullible, more skeptical. And, and I think there are ways of encouraging people to realize that you can't believe everything you hear on the internet. I've got a cartoon that I use in my uh, in the current chapter I've got that says, uh, well, uh, one guy's talking to another, he says, he said, well, I do, I do think twice before I believe what I see in the internet. I think, really? And then I think, oh yeah. <laughs> so you got to do better than that. So thinking twice has got to mean applying something you learn about the nature of real information. That is, was it acquired from good sources? Was it acquired by interaction with the world? Or is this just some clown making stuff up because he's got a personal interest that's being satisfied by? So we need, need to, people to be more gullible and more skeptical. And I think there's possibility of doing that. One psychologist has an interesting study which, which has 
something he calls a, a, a measure of what he calls bullshit susceptibility. <laughs> uh, and so by people asking people very questions, he gets the a pretty good counts of the extent to which people are ready to believe stuff that's just made up. And through lots of measures, including philosophy courses on critical thinking, we really want to reduce the general bullshit susceptibility in the world. So I think we need we need preventive techniques as well that in, that are are used to do this. And of course, some of these preventive techniques are tied in with uh, with the political action things to change the world so that it's not so incredibly easy to get people taken in by ridiculous views. So some of that can be done at the level of the the um, social media themselves. So Facebook occasionally has uh, said, well, we're trying, we're working on this. We're trying to reduce misinformation, but they have a horrible conflict of interest. Their conflict of interest is they make money by selling ads to people who get other people interested in watching them. So the best way for Facebook to make money is to say, is to get people to say really extreme things because that gets people excited. They pass it on. I mean, this is the profit uh, operation for both Twitter and Facebook. Get lots of people involved. And the way to get lots of people involved is to say, exciting, outrageous things, because then people, without thinking about it, pass it on to somebody else. So there's a huge conflict of interest in the social media interests. That they're based on not accuracy, not important. They're just based on what's emotionally engaging. And that incentive is just really bad. So that's why part of the what I call pre-information, preventive information, is to change that world. And so that all of the social media accounts, which are largely are close to monopolies. If you look at Facebook or Twitter, they've got all these worlds entirely themselves. That gives them a social obligation to do it way better than they're doing. And that, I think, can be produced by laws that are brought in. Australia, for example, right now is bringing in it's pretty reasonable laws to deal with it. And uh, other countries need to do the same thing. The European community is also, European Union is also moving toward ways of slowing the spread of misinformation on social media, which I think would make a big difference. So my third way of finding ways to fight against misinformation is this third one of having these preventive strategies to keep it from arising in the first place. Yeah. Um, since you brought it up, do you think technology is, because a lot of law observers see technology as neutral, as just amplifying whatever social, political, psychological impulses might exist and and doing it at a larger scale? Or do you think there is a novel change in that the social media of today has gone a, a further direction in perpetuating misinformation? I, I don't think there's any point in talking generally about whether technology is good or bad. Sometimes it's horrible. Uh, we could Another thing to worry about now is nuclear war, which could come out of the Ukraine crisis. And obviously that would be horrible. That could kill half the population of, of the planet. Um, but in the specific case, you can look and see what's doing. And so obviously, I love computers. I started doing computational philosophy, which was a kind of crazy thing to do, but it, it actually turns out to be very productive. Uh, so I love computers, and it's great to have that technology to work with. But if you look at, and there's some ways in which social media have benefited people uh, during the pandemic, it was a major way in which people could interact with each other. Uh, and so I used to love giving talks. And I haven't given a talk in person now for more than two years, but still, I enjoy giving uh, giving Zoom presentations. I got ones coming up in Helsinki and Amsterdam and Phil and Pennsylvania, and obviously, it was great to have the technology to do that. But if you look at misinformation, it's clear that the effects of social media have been horrible. Why? It really is different. I mean, it used to be that if you had some crackpot idea, well, maybe you could sneak it into a letter to the editor in the newspaper, but probably not because there were editors there, there were gatekeepers. And so there are newspapers or TVs, but it was all under some degree of control. But once, uh, once Facebook messages and uh, well, email to some extent, but Twitter became accessible, available, then you could take your crazy idea and get it out to people really fast. And you can use those same technologies to find people who's crazy as you. Whereas ordinarily, it would have been one crazy person in Ontario, another crazy person in Pennsylvania. But now they become parts of groups. And so I don't think there's any question that with respect to misinformation, the effect of social media has been absolutely horrible because you can get people spreading their crazy evidence-free ideas to 
thousands or millions of people instantaneously. And the effect has been very serious in all the domains that I talk about, in politics, in health, in, uh, in climate. Uh, so I think that from that point of view, it's pretty clear that the internet and social media have been horrible with respect to the increase in the spread of misinformation. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned Facebook, right? Like it, it just is built into the model that it is the world's largest advertising platform and one of the large, world's largest sources of information. And it is incentivized too. The, the algorithm is the more the better it is trained with user engagement, the better it performs as an advertising tool. So, and the, of course, the hot new social medium is uh, TikTok. And I just read to my horror that uh, a couple of surveys found that for younger people who tend to be on TikTok rather than Facebook, Facebook is what their old folks do. Uh, that the major source of news for teenagers is TikTok. TikTok is a source of news. That's completely shocking. It's obviously just people making cute videos, but that's how people are getting their news. And this is just appalling because there's no good basis for thinking that anything you learn from a TikTok video is actually true. But because they use videos rather than just text, they're they're very engaging. They can be very emotionally engaging. And, and a bunch of a lot of people, uh, especially the young people who are using TikTok, have gotten really good at making the visual medium highly appealing but the thought that this is providing a source of of news or a source of medical information is really appalling uh, one really extreme case of what i call motivated reasoning using the psychological term is now called manifesting i was looking at a whole bunch of tiktok videos about manifesting manifesting is just plain out wishful thinking it's a view that if you want something you just manifest it which means you just wish for it uh, and there's all sorts of people on tiktok saying Hey, this works. It worked for me, uh, and and it's just appalling. People need to realize that TikTok is a horrible place to get your news. If you want to have ideas, if you want to have beliefs that are actually true of the world, rather than of some random TikTok influencer. Right, right. It really, yeah, uh, it's a whole world. Like people build their own hierarchies for whatever their belief system is for everything. It, it's astonishing. Yeah. But, it, but it's much more extreme than it used to be. It used to be that people would see the same kind of news reports on TV. There were just a few channels or there were a few newspapers, a few magazines. There used to be various ways in which someone with a kind of nutty belief would encounter an alternative. But now it's really easy on any of these social media to find a circle of people who believe just like you, who believe in manifesting or uh, and the dangers of vaccines and people just reinforce each other. And of course, then they spread it to other people through these very popular sources. Yeah. I mean, when the pandemic started, it really struck me how quick the anti-vax movement was because there was always, I mean, medicine denial, anti-vax movements around, but they were never that intense. Like you went from denial to a pretty well, well formulated, easy to spread ideology within, I mean, fewer than months, weeks. Yeah, well, the anti-vaxxers were already organized because they've been active in things like school groups. And so a, a small minority of, of uh, parents were concerned about it. And so they were, they were organized and there was some activity there, but it was still really quite small. I mean, the vast majority of people, especially in uh, countries like Canada, were getting their children vaccinated. But it was already there. But then... Once the pandemic came along, it got tied in with all sorts of other issues, uh, issue, political issues. So especially in the United States, the Republicans, or at least some of the Republicans, made it a political issue. Uh, and if you look at the Freedom Convoy in Canada, the, the vaccination issues got tied in with questions of freedom and, and questions about being anti-government. And so I think it's absolutely appalling the way that misinformation spread that managed to combine uh, political misinformation with medical misinformation. And not accidentally, a lot of these same people are skeptics about climate change as well. And so you get these perfect storms of misinformation coming from several directions. And the effects are potentially just disastrous on, on all accounts. Do, do you have any general thoughts towards uh, the popular discourse on, on freedom of speech these days? Well, this is where you need philosophy again. So philosophers have got a long history of discussing freedom of speech. There's, there's 
really quite a good literature on it. And if you know the thinking on freedom of speech, you realize it's not absolute. Almost nobody in philosophy has said there's an absolute right to free speech. Even, you know, I was appalled the other day, Barack Obama was quoted as saying, well, I'm a free speech absolutist. Well, no, he's not. Uh, maybe, maybe Elon Musk is, but Elon Musk doesn't know any philosophy, because Barack Obama, I presume, does as part of his legal background. So free speech absolute is, is a crazy view. And so people uh, who've talked about this carefully, going back to, say, John Stuart Mill. So John Stuart Mill is sometimes viewed by uh, by libertarians as as one of their own, but he wasn't. His ideas about liber- liberty were actually quite quite measured, uh, and he makes it clear that you don't have an absolute right to free speech. It's important that people should have free speech. I, I agree with that. It's an important part of society, but it's not unlimited. And so, if you're harming someone else, if you're telling someone else that they should go, uh, should that someone else should be lynched or set on fire. Well, you don't have the right to say that. Free speech doesn't go that far. So free speech is always limited by harms that are called. And so the the cost. Uh, And so you need to be able to balance the undeniable good of having freedom of speech. It's really important for the spread of real information against the harms that are caused. And so this great philosophical tradition, going back to John Stuart Mill, it's probably before that, for all I know, uh, shows the need for careful philosophical discussions of why free speech is valuable, and I think there's lots of reasons it's valuable, and why it's limited by harms that are caused to other people. Uh, So once you do that, then you can look at specific specific cases. You can look, for example, at people who are spreading lies about about COVID. Well, if it's going to kill hundreds of thousands of people, which I think is what happened in the United States, then you've got really good reason to think that freedom of speech may is not unlimited in that case, that you want to, in fact, constrain it. Um, so the philosophical discussion of free speech is infinitely more sophisticated than what you find in uh, people who go around marching about freedom. It's actually quite subtle and important to look at case by case, whether people are free to speak in some ways, or whether, in fact, they're causing harm that's sufficient to make sure that it should be limited in those cases. Right. Okay. Uh, Shifting gears a little bit. Uh, We were talking about inference. So how is inference or rationality as we should think about, we should think about it cognitively different from inference in the way that we think about it in, in standard logic, for example. I think there's lots of interconnections. There's some overlap, but you have to take into account the limitations of human minds. Um, so, for example, in uh, logic-based epistemology, it was standard to believe that everyone believes all the logical consequences of their beliefs. That's an infinite set. <laughs> we don't have infinite minds. And so any epistemology that says you believe all of the infinite logical concept, that, I mean, that just won't begin. So we need to take into account what, what, how, how brains operate, how minds operate. Another problem with some approaches to epistemology that ignores this is probability theory. A probability theory is an enormously useful tool in all sorts of different scientific and medical areas. Uh, but to think that somehow people are, are and should be thinking always in probabilities, I think is implausible. There are lots of difficulties about that. For one thing, uh, the best mechanisms available for calculating the probabilities, namely Bayes networks, are computationally intractable. And so if you try to do everything with Bayes networks, you quickly discover that you don't have nearly enough computing power or enough brain power to do it. So we need more efficient ways. So I think that a lot of the abstractions that come out of the logical tradition just won't work because they go beyond human capacities. But human capacities aren't horrible. We can certainly do good kinds of reasoning and we can identify how they work. I mentioned uh, the philosophical slogan of inference to the best explanation. This is how science has worked long before that slogan was formulated in the 20th century. The basic idea is when you want to reach a conclusion about something important like COVID-19 or climate change or uh, inequality among different races, you look at the evidence. You look at the evidence and you consider different hypotheses that will explain the evidence. And you evaluate those hypotheses with respect to the evidence and with respect to alternative hypotheses. You want to get a hypothesis that's better than alternative explanations because it explains more of the evidence and because it's simpler. It makes fewer assumptions. You also want the hypothesis to be self-explained by a deeper mechanism. Uh, For example, you can say that COVID-19 
is caused by the coronavirus, the novel coronavirus. Well, that's really good, but we want to know, how does that work? Well, science has been wonderful on that. We know the genetic structure of the coronavirus. We know how its genetic structure enables it to get access to cells. So we've got a whole layer of explanations that make the coronavirus explanation of the disease, COVID-19, way better than lots of other crazy ideas that can be out there. So within this kind of inductive reasoning, we've got the, the, the informal logic of inference to the best explanation, which I think makes complete sense of how medical reasoning can work, how reasoning about COVID-19. And so one of the things that philosophy is valuable for is exploring the nature of this kind of informal logic of how this kind of reasoning works. And of course, how it can be done badly. It can be done badly if you don't consider alternative hypotheses, or if you just jump to a hypothesis because it suits with your personal goals, because you want to attack China, for example. And so you need to be able to consider both the kinds of inferential mechanisms that people use when they're doing it well, but also the way in which psychological mechanisms can mislead them and lead them astray. So reasoning in that sense, is it are we using this anonymously with how we think of intelligence as a cognitive phenomena, or is there a difference there? Now, intelligence is a much broader idea. So reasoning is part of intelligence, but lots of other things are part of it too. I think, for example, that uh, this is in my book, Bots and Beasts, that I published last year. It's got a whole description of what I take to be the, I think it's 12 features and eight mechanisms. Of, of, so I think consciousness, for example, is actually a mechanism of intelligence. Consciousness is useful because it makes you aware of what you're thinking and of what other people are thinking using empathy. So uh, reasoning is part of intelligence, but it's it's not everything there is to intelligence. Intelligence is already. Okay. Um, it, it might make sense just to talk about coherence uh, here. So how, first of all, what is coherence and how did it come to play such a large role in your thinking? Well, let me provide some background. <laughs> uh, this has taken me a long time back to when I was an undergraduate doing my, my second BA. I did my first BA in Saskatchewan, and the second I did at Cambridge. And while I was cam at Cambridge, uh, I think it was uh, my, <clears throat> my tutor there uh, was Ian Hacking, who later became a professor at the University of Toronto. And he assigned me a book by Chomsky to read, uh, Language in Mind, which is a wonderful book. I, that was probably my first exposure to cognitive science, although I didn't think of it as that. I just thought it was a, a really fascinating book. And he had a footnote in there about the importance of a kind of inference I hadn't heard of called abduction. So that's his first name for what we would now call inference to the best explanation. It's reaching a conclusion because it provides the best explanation of the evidence. Um, but following up on abduction, I came across Gilbert Harmon, who's the one who popularized the term interest the best explanation. And he was always talking about explanatory coherence. This is the idea that when you conclude that a hypothesis is true because it's part of the best explanation, you got to take into account everything you know, the whole coherence set. So I think he got uh, the idea from, Wolf, from Wilfred Sellers of talking about explanatory coherence, but I never took coherence that seriously then. But I certainly knew about it, and I wrote a lot about inference to the best explanation, including my the PhD thesis. Um, how I got interested in coherence was actually uh, as a result of working on neural networks. Um, so after I did my PhD, I got my first job teaching philosophy at the University of Michigan at Dearborn. I met a psychologist, Richard Nisbet, and he got me really interested in psychology. Um, and I started working with uh, another psychologist, Keith Holyoke. And a bunch of years later, after we'd written a book on induction, the three of us plus John Holland, uh, Keith was reviewing the books about connectionism that were published in 1986, the Carol Lewis Distributed Processing books. And, and he got the idea that, hey, this could work for analogy. And that the neural networks that were being used for much more low-level things, such as concept application, might work for analogy, because he and I have been trying to work on analogy for quite a long time. And I don't know if it would work, but by this time, because I'd done the master's degree in computer science, I was a pretty good programmer. So I said, well, I'll try to code this up and see if it works. Can I actually take two different complicated uh, an uh, analogs, for example, and famous example in philosophy is that Socrates is the mid midwife of ideas. Can a philosopher be a midwife? What, how do you make sense of that? Uh, well, I use my background in logic to formalize this, and I use my newfound knowledge in computer science to write a program that would actually do the mapping 
by building a neural network that would then figure out what all the correspondences were. And I couldn't believe how well this worked. It just, it was just absolutely beautiful. This is an incredibly hard problem that the neural network was solving. So I started thinking, well, is there anything else that these, this kind of neural network would be useful for? And then I remembered explanatory coherence. I remembered the idea from Harman that says, well, you can evaluate theories by considering how they're coherent with everything else. And so I realized that coherence was analogous to analogy. And so I wrote, I wrote a neural network program that did uh, coherence stuff. It's one of my most cited papers called Explanatory Coherence. So I published in Behavioral and Brain Science. And uh, since then, I'm still developing applications of it. The new book on misinformation applies it to COVID, applies it to climate change, applies it to all these other cases too. So I still think it's a really important way of understanding what goes on when people evaluate a hypothesis. You're looking at the coherence of the hypothesis with all the evidence, with alternative hypotheses, and with the higher level explanations that figure that tell you what the mechanisms are. So coherence has a long history in philosophy, going back really to Hegel in the 19th century British idealist, but it was always very vague and mushy. That was true of Harman's work as well. It was always this, but once I figured out how to get a neural network to do it, I turned it into a mechanism. I turned it into an algorithm, which I eventually turned into a mathematical characterization, which people could prove theorems about. So that was how coherence became really important and still is very important in the thinking that I'm doing. I use coherence a lot in the book I've got coming out next month, coming out in June, uh, which is about balance. So this book combines an account of how balance works when you're trying to keep from falling over while you're walking, or how balance works when you get vertigo uh, because you've had too many Molson's. Uh, so it, it's all about the coherence is important for that because what your brain is doing is very effectively coming up with a coherent interpretation of all the information it's getting from your eyes, from your limbs, uh, from your internal organs. This is all going into the brainstem, which comes up with a coherent interpretation. So coherence turned out to be really important for the balance book as well. I, I grew up reading a lot of Hegel as well. And yeah, and and became a bit disillusioned with it because of exactly what you pointed out. Uh, but computational logic it seems so interesting and such a promising way to to rescue it. Well, Hegel says really vague things like the true is the whole. Uh, and what do you what does that mean? Well, a way of interpreting it is to say that figuring out what's true requires coherence of everything that you know. But how do you possibly do that? How could that be something that a mere brain with only 86 billion neurons could do. Well, my neural network approach to coherence explains that. So it takes this idea of coherence that was really pretty vague in Hegel and his disciples, and turns it into something that's actually mechanistic and moves into science as well. So I think you could take some of the real epistemological insights that Hegel had. Actually, I think he had a number of ways in which he was it was really way ahead of his time. It's hard to tell because the writing is so bad. That's a tradition, I think, that was started by Kant. But his epistemological views are way superior to Kant's because he gives up on what later got to be called the myth of the given, that you can just have things given in experience. Uh, instead, he realized, no, it's all a matter of development. It's all a matter of coherence. And so I think these are epistemological ideas that originated with Hegel, which are really important. But they need to be translated into understandable language and ultimately connected up with ideas from science. So the the balance book, uh, how do you go from coherence from the base epistemic metaphysical considerations uh, all the way up to cognition and the social sciences? Okay, that's the second part of the book. Uh, so I, I initially got interested in balance because years ago I had a case of vertigo, not, not from drinking too much Molson's, uh, but I had the kind that's called benign because it's a matter of the uh, uh, crystals in your inner ear getting out of place. And fortunately, there's a, a good a good head exercises you can do called the Epley maneuver that gets them back into place. So my vertigo cleared up after a year or two of doing these exercises. But that got me interested in it. And as a result, I signed up for a course on Tai Chi because Tai Chi is supposed to be good for balance. And... Uh, uh, I, I don't know if it was particularly, actually there is evidence that it's good for balance, but the explanation that the teacher gave, he was, uh, uh, he was an expert uh, trained in Hong Kong, uh, 
was total nonsense. <laughs> I, mean, I, I believe Tai Chi, actually, I, I got to really, I still do it twice a week. I, I like Tai Chi a lot. But the explanation that's given it, it has to do with the fact that you're um, uh, resetting your yin and yang balance by moving chi around, I thought was complete, completely bogus because it's not compatible with modern medicine. Uh, but then I realized, hey, that's a, that's a, that's a, a balanced metaphor because it's, it's claiming that you're improving your physical balance by balancing the yin and the yang. Well, that's an interesting metaphor. So then I started tracking balanced metaphors. And of course, one of the biggest came right at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, this was you know, two years ago when people said, well, in figuring out how to deal with the pandemic, we have to have, find a balance between people's lives and livelihoods. If you remember, this was the big issue. Can you shut down the economy? Well, no, because then people don't have any. So we need a balance between health and their livelihoods. Well, this is another balance metaphor. Eventually, I collected more than 50 of these. So the, the second half of the book is all about balance metaphors. But my account of balance metaphors is, again, all about coherence. So just as you need coherence to figure out what's going on in your body and what's going on in the world to make sure that you feel well balanced when you're walking rather than experience, um, experiencing vertigo. Similarly, when someone throws a balance metaphor at you, such as yin and yang or lives and livelihoods, you have to figure out whether that's coherent. Does it actually make sense? And these are all, these metaphors all have underlying analogies. I remember I said before that my work on coherence was inspired by the work on analogy. And basically, analogy is a kind of coherence. So if you say that uh, balancing your body is like uh, balancing yin and yang, you've got to figure out whether that correspondence actually works. And so the second part of the book applies coherence ideas to providing ways of figuring out which metaphors are good or bad. In fact, I, I break them down into four categories. So balanced metaphors can be strong, weak, bogus or toxic. And so I think some metaphors are actually just appallingly toxic. Uh, so if you look at some of the metaphors that are used by anti-vaxxers, for example, uh, that using balance, th those are toxic because they encourage people not to get vaccinated, which can kill them or their children. Uh, so here, what's, here's an example. One naturalist, oh, sorry, not naturalist, naturopath said that uh, you shouldn't give children vaccines because it disturbs the natural balance in their body. Well, that's that's a balanced metaphor because there's no measurable kind of balance involved there. Uh, and it's a toxic one because if you follow it, you are going to make your kid more likely to get sick, maybe not die, but certainly get serious disease like measles. Uh, so some balanced metaphors, like the ones used in medicine, are usually toxic. Others are actually kind of, are actually kind of useful that you find... Uh, for example, in talking about um, equilibrium and climate systems. Equilibrium is another balanced metaphor, but I think it's a good one and sometimes useful. Right at the end of the book, I talk about the use of balanced metaphors in philosophy. So if you know work in political philosophy or ethics, you might have encountered the idea of reflective equilibrium. Well, this comes from John Rawls in one of the, in the most influential book in political philosophy in the 20th century, his theory of justice. And he uses the idea of reflective equilibrium to say we should find a balance in our minds between our intuitions and our judgments. Well, I wouldn't call this toxic, but I think it's actually weak or probably bogus, because I think there are better ways of coming up with political and ethical views than reflective equilibrium. But that's how coherence pervades the balance book as well. Yeah, I mean, just to pursue that line of reasoning, for, line of thought for a second. Um, I think cognitive science has made a huge amount of progress in refining how we should think about intelligence, thinking, rationality, all these things that we've been talking about. Do you think that that has translated over to the social sciences? I know you you talk about problems in economics, the economic thinking around rationality. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, social sciences, it's enormous, and it should be much bigger than it has been. I try to show this at length in the the second book of my three book treatise that came out in 2019, it's called Mind Society. So I systematically show the relevance of cognitive science to politics and economics and anthropology and education, which is applied science. So I think the impact should have been bigger than it has, but it's certainly very large, as you can see by the current impact of ideas like motivated reasoning throughout the social sciences. There still are 
retrograde traditions, especially in economics, where the idea that you can make abstract mathematical models that have no connection with reality, and just because you're good at math, that's somehow that makes you an important economist. I mean, that's still that's still influential there, but more and more economics is being forced to become more empirical, which is forcing it to become more psychological. So yeah, I think cognitive science has had a really excellent impact on economics and political science. Absolutely. Behavioral economics has been fantastic to see develop. Yeah, wonderful change. Uh, largely, originally due by Kahneman and Tversky, but hundreds of others, of others researchers as well have tried to make economics much more empirical than it was before and deal with the fact that it couldn't explain really elementary things like depressions and recessions and inflation. For those things, you need to consider the minds of the people who are making economic decisions. Right, right. Long way to go still, but it's hopeful. Okay. Okay. Uh, so you think that we can, so connectionist models, you think we can use connections, connectionist models and coherence to to explain cognition completely? Well, no, because, because I mean, there are lots of different connections models, lots of ways of doing neural networks. Um, and so the coherence models that I did uh, decades ago and still use, are, I think, are, 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 are still important. But I've done lots of neural network models since then that have been more sophisticated in different areas. So one of the big advances in cognitive science really over the last 20 years is that the neural network models have become much more neural. So my coherence models use very abstract neurons. They're not much like the neurons in the brain. But since then, really the last 10 or 20 years, the field of theoretical neuroscience has, has taken off. There's a huge amount of data available because of brain scanning experiments. But to explain them, the field of theoretical neuroscience has developed more and more realistic neural models. So they're actually modeling real, real neurons. So I've been very fortunate to have a colleague, uh, Chris Elias Smith, who's both a philosopher and a cognitive science, scientist and a theoretical neuroscientist who's developed some of the most biologically realistic models of neurons that, uh, that just didn't, didn't exist before. And they, and they do all sorts of explanatory tasks that my own coherence models weren't capable of. So let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, I've got fairly new theories, new meaning in the last decade, of consciousness and emotions. And um, there's no way I could add a theory of consciousness and emotions using my coherence models and the very simple kinds of neural networks they use. But Chris Elias has developed these ideas about neural representation and processing that I think apply very well to these really complicated ideas that take us up to the very highest level of human thinking. Uh, the sorts of things that phenomenologists might be concerned about. So take emotions, for example. Emotions are conscious, largely. Uh, so what, what are you feeling? What's going on when you feel happy or sad or love or shame? Or uh, an emotion I've gotten really interested in recently, which is cringing. Okay. <laughs> cringing, cringing is a really complicated emotion because it's part embarrassment, partly disgust. It's partly physiological because you're drawing away from things. So what's going on in all these cases? Well, I think that the theory of emotions that I've got based on Chris's ideas of how the brain works are actually really quite good. I'm sure they're not the end, but they're, I think, a big advance over previous theories of emotion and previous theories of consciousness. Right. Reading through semantic point of art, Semantic pointer architecture was was a lot of fun in preparing for this interview. So Chris's semantic pointers are a, a, a very sophisticated kind, kind of, of neural representation. So, so a neural representation, I'm saying this for your authors, for your readers, for, for your listeners, uh, this, uh, a neural representation occurs because you've got a bunch of neurons that are firing together in a way that can stand for things in the world. Uh, for example, you can have a bunch of neurons that fire together because they recognize Brad Pitt. And so you could kind of have the, bad, the Brad Pitt uh, neural representation because of a particular fire pattern. Well, semantic pointers are really interesting ways in which you can combine different kinds of neural representations. And so you could have the Brad Pitt holding a microphone semantic pointer, which is a more complicated kind of neural representation because it has to get in there holding and microphone. But Chris's ideas are sufficiently rich that you can actually do this. You can build computer programs that will do this kind of combined neural representation. And what I do with the theory of emotions is apply it to 
these complex cases, like feeling happy that Brad Pitt is holding a microphone. Is there, believe it or not, we can give an explanation of how neural mechanisms enable the construction of these kinds of complex representations in human brains. So what do you think of predictive processing? Predictive processing has been very popular yeah. lately. Yeah, I think it's got largely undeserved popularity. Um, the, the strong claims are made that the, the brain is a predictive engine. Well, the brain is a predictive engine. That's one of at least five different things that it does. But it lots of, does lots of other things as, true as well. We don't just predict things. We also explain things that have already happened. We also have patterns that, that we recognize in what's going on. We also have to figure out ways to get along with other people, to communicate with other people. This is also really important. So prediction is part of that story, but it's one of maybe five things that we do. Um, so that's one problem with it. And there are real problems with the hypotheses about how the brain is a predictive engine. The predictive engine view goes along with Bayesian views of the brain. And I think it's okay to say that brain behaves as if it's Bayesian, but to say that the brain is actually doing Bayesian probability calculations is really problematic. First of all, nobody has a clue how neural neurons, actual neurons, are doing Bayesian calculations. Uh, unlike the, the coherence things I've talked about or the, or the semantic pointers, we know how real neurons can do that. Uh, but moreover, there are these problems of computational intractability because Bayesian networks, as I've said before, are computationally intractable. The amount of time it takes to do things goes up exponentially. Uh, so you have to have some kind of approximation to figure out how it works. So I don't think there's any reason to believe that the brain is a Bayesian engine, which means that the mechanism by which predictive processing zealots claim it works is utterly implausible. So I, I don't think predictive processing is a, is a good view of the brain. I think there's much better views of the brain coming out of theoretical neuroscience, such as Chris Elias's semantic pointer hypothesis. Right. So Bayesian, so to view the brain as a Bayesian engine is kind of an ideal to look at, but in reality, you're going to need to find empirical evidence, and it turns out to be a lot more murky than that. Yeah, I think it's okay to say, well, sometimes when the brain is working really well, right. for, for example, in good kinds of perception, it's as if the brain is a Bayesian engine, but as if isn't a mechanism. Right, that's an analytic choice. It doesn't accomplish anything in the way of finding empirical evidence. Yeah, so I, I haven't seen a single case where predictive processing approaches can explain anything better than alternative, more neurologically realistic views right. like the semantic pointer hypothesis. It actually quite astonishes me how they become so popular, but they certainly are popular. Yeah, I mean, it seems like everywhere, Bayes' theorem, everyone wants to squeeze Bayes' theorem into everything. Yeah, without any evidence. Yeah. Without any evidence that that's how the brain is working, or without even evidence that that's how the brain could work, yeah. given the probabilities of computational intractability, sorry, given the, the problems of computational intractability that I mentioned. Well, there's, a, there's an old saying that applies in many different fields. Uh, when your only tool is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Right. And the Bayesian hammer is powerful. It's, it's exact. Uh, there are computer models. Uh, and so people just sort of hammer it away, all these different things. But they're not looking at the alternatives. Uh, they're, they're, they're like theologians thinking that the soul explains anything, everything. When, in fact, I think there are better alternatives around coming out of theoretical neuroscience that's much closer to how the brain actually works. Right. Okay. So maybe more to the point, multiple realizability, uh, which is for anyone listening, just the idea that it's the question whether uh, the brain cognition, if it's applied in a system that's not, bio oh no, a substrate that's not biological, is it the same thing? What, what are your thoughts about multiple realizability? So let me go back to the, the 60s and 70s. <laughs> Uh, multiple realizability is an idea that arose in the 60s and 70s because ideas about computation were being developed. Uh, the Turing machine ideas, the first computer programs were being written. And in philosophy, this got imported as the idea that it doesn't really matter what kind of hardware you're working with. What matters is the software. So a Turing machine is just a big tape with squares on it and a head that moves around. It's not a real thing at all. It's basically a mathematical abstraction. And philosophers like Hilary Putnam and Jerry Fodor generalized from this to think that when we're thinking about the mind, we don't have to think about the hardware. It doesn't matter whether it's a brain or a computer. What matters is it's computing different kinds of functions. And so they developed an idea called functionalism, which says, just look at the function. Don't look at the hardware that's computing the function. So multiple realizability 
is a way of saying that you can realize thinking in different ways. You can realize it in a computer, you can realize it in a brain, maybe you can really realize it in the force field in some alien intelligence. So it does, you can ignore the hardware. And I, this was actually, I think, a, a very plausible view in the 1960s and the 70s and going into the 80s. And there are still lots of philosophers who take this as dogma. But already in the 1980s, it started to become implausible. Why? Because neural network ideas developed. They developed through brain scanning techniques, which meant you could look into brains for the first time and be able to say, oh, that means this part of the brain is being used or that part of the brain. That was the new technology that really got developed in the 80s through uh, uh, different kinds of brain scans. But at the same time, in the 80s, ideas about neural networks started taking off. The idea of the brain as a parallel distributed processor that the PDP group came up with. So I published an article way back in the late 80s called Parallel Computation in the Mind, Pro Mind Body Problem, uh, where I argue that multiple realizability was a problem. Because once you start looking at parallel computation and why it's got advantages over serial computation, you get a different story. So consider speed, for example. The Turing machine doesn't worry about speed, and abstract computation doesn't worry about speed. But if you're a living organism, like a human trying to survive in the jungle, you care about speed. So the fact that you can compute in a, in a few milliseconds that there's a lion coming after you really matters. So once you bring time into it, parallel computation becomes very important. Now, parallel computation is a matter of hardware, not software. So computers nowadays have a little bit of parallelism. So if you buy a typical computer, it might have four cores in it or 16 cores, or maybe if you're really rich, 64 cores, which means it's got 64 different processors. So it's got a little bit of parallelism. But the parallelism in the brain is astonishing. You have 86 billion neurons and they don't have a central clock. They're all just doing their own thing in coordination with each other, but not completely controlled. So the, the parallel computation enables brains, which have these really slow neurons, and they, they maybe operate 100 times a second, immensely slower than the computer chips, to actually do wonderful things. And people are still way smarter than any computer that we've got running it. I show that in the book, Bots and Beasts. Right. Um, so parallel computation was one hint. The recent argument I gave on this issue of multiple, against multiple realizability, against the philosophical view called functional, functionalism, uh, was based on energy. So I mentioned earlier how I got into information because of this concern with energy. But the main point of the paper on energy that I just published is that if you look not just at time, but look at energy, it really matters a lot what the hardware is. So the brain not only has this marvelous property of parallel computation, it's astonishingly energy efficient. So I want to ask, your brain actually takes about 20% of your body's energy. It's surprising given that it's a small organ that it's taking. But even so, it's only using, by current estimates, something like 40 watts of energy. That's hardly any energy to do more and more powerful things. So if you look at current supercomputers or programs that are doing things like IBM Watson, excuse me, IBM Watson or deep learning programs, or actually the worst case is the computers that are, are being used for Bitcoin mining, which is one of the biggest travesties in current technology, you find massive uses of energy required. And so the brain is actually really incredibly efficient. And so that's why computer science and theoretical neuroscience has developed a new field called neuromorphic computing, which I also learned about from Chris Elias. So the idea is, you want to make computers more like the brain in order to make them more energy efficient because energy really matters. It matters to biological organisms like us because we don't have an infinite supply of, of energy, but it also matters to computers. It matters that Bitcoin takes the energy of a small country to be able to do its crazy mining operations. So energy matters to computing. That means that hardware matters because different kinds of energy run on different kinds of hardware or put it differently, different kinds of hardware use different kinds of energy. So computers use electrical energy, but brains use biochemical energy, and that makes a big difference. That's why we have 100 different kinds of neurons and 100 different kinds of neurotransmitters. They're doing different things for timing and different things for, for energy. So if you're concerned at all with speed and, and, and energy, then you realize that 
multiple realizability and the philosophical doctrines it's built on called functionalism or sometimes substrate independence are implausible. And so that's what the new philosophy of science article is about. So, okay. So it's not that you can't theoretically realize, realize on a different kind of architecture. It's just that it needs to be closer in the considerations of energy. The things that we've learned from PDP and neural networks need to be considered if you want that approach to be successful. That's right. Um, so it's more than the PDP networks. Those were pretty simple. They weren't very biologically natural. But if you start looking at neuromorphic computing and realize how it is that the brain is operating in parallel and with astonishing energy efficiency, you realize that's a big part of our intelligence. That's a big part of our ability to operate in a complex world where we have to make quick decisions. Uh, and so computers are under time pressures too. Often if they want to be able to uh, function, if you want robots to function, if you want to be able to use them to make good decisions rather than run the computer for several days in order to do something that a human being can do in a second. So I think that from point of view of computing, if you make it completely abstract, if you go down to the level of Turing machines, uh, then you can abstract away from hardware. But Turing machines don't worry about time. They don't worry about space because they, by definition, have an infinite tape. But we don't have infinite tapes. We've got finite numbers of neurons. So if you're interested in time, space, and energy, no one ever worries about the energy supply for a, a Turing machine because it's a mathematical abstraction. But if you're worried about time, space, and energy, you realize that you've got to ignore these abstractions and realize that for real life computation in computers as well as in people, you've got to pay attention to the hardware and you've got to throw out these ideas that were plausible in the 60s and 70s but aren't plausible anymore. Do you think about the ethical concerns in AI? Uh, transhumanism all, oh, that all stuff. the time yeah. okay yeah. yeah so so my book bots and beasts um the last two chapters are actually about the ethics of ai the second last chapter is about both uh, i should say that bots and beasts is a three-way comparison it compares the intelligence in humans non-human animals and computers and people have often talked comparing humans and animals and and comparing humans and computers but i think this is the first book that actually compares all three um, but as I was doing the comparison, ethical issues crop up all the time because one reason you're interested about how animals and computers compare with us in intelligence is what are the ethical obligations that come with it. So the second last chapter considers the ethics of both animals and computers. But then the final chapter is a thorough discussion of ethics and artificial intelligence. So that's two chapters on the ethics of, of AI in that book. Okay, so what are the ethical con um, concerns when it comes to AI? Oh, well, there are lots of them. There's many serious problems. One, of course, is questions of employment. So AI has made dramatic advances in the last decade. That's why it's been so much more interesting. And there's been real progress using ideas like uh, deep learning, reinforcement learning. Um, so it's quite impressive. And so people started to worry, oh, my God, we're going to be replaced. We're all going to be unemployed. This would be really bad. Well, for one reason, people wouldn't have money to be able to provide food and things like that. But it's also important for other reasons that people need to have useful things right. to do. They need to have a sense of achievement, a sense of competence, a sense of... Uh, so, so these are... If people don't have work, they're going to have to find other ways of doing it. So that's one. One that's already a problem right now is questions of killer robots. You can have chips on drones capable of making decisions on their own to kill people which I think is appalling. Um, so you've got killer robots are already real. They're already out there in the world. Um, and of course, to let, there are already people who are losing their jobs to AI um, that in ways that it's only going to increase. So those are two of the, the, the ethical issues that I'm concerned about. On, on the other end of that, do you think about the origin of life at all? Uh, and is it at all relevant to, to your work in cognitive science? It's relevant because I've been interested in the concept of life because I think it provides lessons about how to understand all these cognitive things like intelligence and reasoning and so on. So nowadays, we actually have a pretty good idea of the mechanisms of life. We know that living things are able to reproduce. They usually have metabolisms, except for vir viruses are, are kind of a difficult case, but everything except viruses, they're going to have a metabolism, they usually have respiration, they usually have digestion, they often have communication. So a theory of life is easy to give now because we can describe all the mechanisms for life. 
It's hard to define life, but that's irrelevant because we've got all these mechanisms we understand. But of course, we want to figure out how did life originate? Uh, so I don't have a theory about that. I don't have the expertise either. But it's obviously some kind of biochemical process that, that made it happen. Um, I guess the more original thing I've probably said, taken from what we know about life today is a conjecture that it's quite possible that we are the only intelligent life in the universe. There's a, there's a bad argument that's given, well, but there's, but there's billions of stars and billions of planets, and it looks fairly easy for life to get produced. So, so maybe, uh, so maybe uh, there's lots of other pieces of intelligence life in, in the universe. Of course, one response is, yeah, well, where are they since we don't have any science? But actually, I think there are aspects, if you look at intelligent life, it may have been kind of a fluke that we ended up with it. That, in fact, we may be unique in the universe. And one thing to look at is not just the origin of life, which I think is pretty simple. If you take a bunch of chemicals floating around, which happens all the time, they can form into more complex chemicals, they can form into amino acids, and maybe form into proteins, and maybe into cells. So no one, we don't know exactly how that works, but I think that's all pretty simple. Yeah, so it's, something, it's a soup and things get mixed together and yeah. you get complexity. But one of the things that's astonishing in the history of life is the formation of multi-cell organisms, eukaryotes. And what happened, and as far as I've been able to find out from looking at the literature, I guess I'm not an expert on this, is eukaryotes only seem to happen once. And it happened when one bacterium captured another bacterium and you ended up with a more powerful energy source. And eukaryotes were the basis for all the other animals, including the animals that eventually got complicated enough to develop nervous systems. And once they had got developed nervous systems, then they could have brains. So I think it seems to me it's an astonishing fluke that nervous systems came out of cellular systems that came out of eukaryotes that somehow by some incredibly accidental occurrence came out of cells. So I'm prepared to believe that there's life all over the universe, that that's pretty easy to do. But I don't see any reason to believe that there are any other intelligence life in, life in the universe other than us, which seems to me to give us extra obligation not to blow it through all the stupid things that are going on in the world today. <laughs> yeah, I think I completely agree. I, it, it's just astonishing that it occurred. For a long time, I thought language was in the same category of things, that it's astonishing that, that language occurred. Uh, well, th that's a, still an open question because no one knows quite how it yes. occurred. But if you look at lots of other animals, lots of other animals have communication. And so there are ways in which different monkeys can communicate with each other uh, and just, uh, just on their own with sort of two syllable things. So that kind of communication, that's, that's all over the place. And there's even communication at much simpler levels, say between trees sending chemical signals, but even, even verbal signals happen in monkeys and, uh, and, uh, and, pr and actually uh, prairie dogs have a very complicated kind of system. They're not, they're not even primates. Uh, but then something happened and nobody knows exactly what happened, maybe a million, million years ago, maybe a hundred thousand years ago, maybe even 50,000 years ago, is that human brains, which already had ways of communicating, developed ways of doing recursive communications. So that you got embeddings. So you could say things like, I know that you know that I know that we're in a podcast now. Uh, so people got this ability to do recursion. And I think that's a big part of what gave human brains capacities that no other primate brains have. And how that came about isn't really known. So it might have been a, some kind of mutation, uh, but that's what Chomsky thinks. But we, we just don't know. Somehow, uh, it could have been a cultural development. It could be that through human interactions, our abilities to think about each other got more complicated. But whether it's cultural or biological, I don't know. But something happened uh, 100,000 years ago. And of course, that's a long time after there already were brains around. Brains have been around for billions of years before we got to this. Uh, so maybe that's another fluke. Uh, it's possible, just in the way that I think eukaryotes were a fluke. In that case, we're doubly fluky as intelligent beings in the universe and make, would make it all the more likely. But I don't understand that one well enough to be sure it's a fluke. Yeah. There's lots of theories, and they keep getting – like there's the cooperative eye hypothesis. Um, Which one is that? The, so the, it's the idea of – I think Michael Tomasello. Um, but it's, it's essentially the idea that humans are unique in the sense that we had a big enough brain – 
with enough computational capacity. And the sclea, I think I'm pronouncing correctly, but essentially your eyeball is white and the, the, your pupil has a dark contrast to it. So the theory is that uh, because of that, you could direct attention and that led to some sort of some sort of availability for minds to be networked together such that they yeah, could, that's, that's another um, possibility I mean, both of these things being could be could be the result of some other kind of development that made us much better at recursion that is the ability of me to think about your thoughts and certainly cooperation is a huge part of what made people people because we're always were parts of groups that could work together to accomplish common goals yeah that, that's another thing i mean sociality amongst humans is is also kind of astonishing yeah oh yeah the hobbesian view that we're, we're all independent in a world where it was nasty British before, that was just nonsense the anthropology now makes it really clear that humans have always been highly cooperative highly interactive and so i think cooperation is as is, is, is more of a characteristic of human beings than competition yeah exactly yeah i mean i could I could believe that there's life in the universe in that there is complexity somewhere. Sure. Um, but does it have had, does it have all of the crazy flukes that, that we got? It is hard to believe. Very hard to believe. Yeah. I think that's hugely improbable, but of course, crazy flukes happen like eukaryotes and maybe language. And so they may have happened twice in the universe, but the, the quasi statistical argument that says there's so many billions of galaxies and billions of stars and billions of planets that it's highly likely that intelligence evolved there too. I don't think that works. The analogy breaks down if the events that made this happen on earth are actually extraordinarily important. And, and, and what else is that I think oftentimes people put a lot of stock into that to find meaning in the universe. Like it, it is a source of meaning. I just think there, there are better ways to find meaning. Oh, I completely agree. Um, I recently published a, an article called Neuroscience, uh, the relevance of neuroscience for the meaning of life. I was asked to do it because I had an earlier book on the brain and the meaning of life. And one of the concerns that people have, if you take a naturalistic or a scientific approach, is that life becomes meaningless. And that's not true at all. Humans are really good at finding meanings in their life. To, to use the slogan, I put it, people, uh, people have three things that provide meaning, love, work, and play. So if you've got relationships with other people, if you've got meaningful, uh, challenging tasks that you can accomplish. And if you've got ways you can have fun, well, I think that's a perfectly meaningful life and that's all that any reasonable person would want. You don't need God and you don't need, you don't need intelligence somewhere else in the universe to think that your life is meaningful. Right. How did you come up with that? The love, work and play slogan? Yes. Well, in the book, it's actually deeper than that because I base it on psychological theories of human needs, but I'll, I'll, I'll go into those if you want. But the love, work, and play slogan started with Freud because I read somewhere that Freud was once asked, uh, what's the meaning of life? And he said, well, life isn't really meaningful at all, but love and love and work aren't bad. And I thought, well, that's sort of stupid. <laughs> it's not just Love and work are meaning because we, we, for all of us, these our personal relationships and uh, and our um, and our, and the work we do matter to us. Right. I, I was once approached by a friend at a conference, and uh, he was going through some sort of crisis. I forget what it was. I, maybe some a woman had broken up with him or something like that. Um, but anyway, he was he was clearly distressed. He said, he, he said, I, I'm beginning to think that that life is meaningless. And so I told him the Freud story. I said, no, it's if you got love and play. And then he said, you know, but what I really like is rock climbing. And I thought, well, I would never go rock climbing, but that's play and play matters. Uh, I've been playing in lots of ways. And so I've got lots of things that I do for fun. I listen to music. Uh, I watch television. I love sports. Uh, I love to exercise. And so these are all play. And I think that they're part of having a meaningful life probably not as important in the abstract as love and work, but sure, as part of everyday life, love, work, and play together, I think makes a, a rich and uh, and enjoyable life. Yeah, couldn't agree more. I mean, I think a lot of academics, myself included, like have the tendency to become very obsessive with their work and, and see, see anything else. But you need to have a life outside of your work. 
Well, that's where the balance metaphors come in again. Uh, so I talk about life work balance. Is this a metaphor which is strong, weak, uh, uh, bogus, or toxic? Well, I actually think it's a strong metaphor because it's getting at what I think of in coherence terms as a constraint satisfaction problem. If you want to have a really good life, you want to have a balance among those things and because they're different constraints. The play provides different kinds of pleasure and relief from the problems that go along sometimes with love and work. Uh, love, but they're, they're, all be, they're all tying into basic human needs and these needs are independent of each other. And if you've got a good balance among them, then your life can be really quite enjoyable and meaningful. Right, right. Okay, shifting gears a little bit. Um, coming back to consciousness, uh, <laughs> to to something more obscure. Um, what what are your views of consciousness? Consciousness is a brain process. Uh, that's a much more plausible view than any of the alternatives, which say that consciousness is a spiritual process done by souls or or by all sorts of ridiculous views that are around right now, such as panpsychism that says that. Consciousness is part of every human universe, but the only entities that we have reason to believe are conscious are, in fact, uh, organisms that have brains, not just humans, but I'm quite convinced that certainly that certainly uh, uh, birds and mammals are conscious as well. Uh, so the only entities in the world that we know to be conscious are, in fact, entities with brains, and we've got an increasingly good idea about how the brains do that. So my theory of, of neural consciousness, it's not the most popular one, there are a few others around that are more popular. But my theory is that it's also tied in with semantic pointers. So semantic pointers I talked about as being neural representations that get combined out of neural, other neural representations. They have this really interesting property that Chris Eliasmus was, I think, the first person to notice that we have a simple neural representation, it can be tied in with the sensory modalities that it came from. So for example, when you see red, there's neural firing that's actually caused in part by the reflection of the light off the red thing in the world. And so the pattern of firing is tied to that. What's cool about semantic pointers is that when you combine them into more complicated representations, you retain some of this connection to the sensory origins. So if you combine red with shirt, for example, so you have shirt is an observation, it's a sensory representation, red is a sensory representation, but now you get the more abstract con concept of a red shirt, you get a semantic pointer, but it's still got some connection with red and shirt. It's not a complete one, you, there's some loss of information there, but you still have the connections. So I argue in natural philosophy that this idea that you retain the modality, I call it modal retention, is a key part in understanding how it is that a neural mechanism, a neural representation, can be connected to these sensory origins. And so that's why you get different experiences. A key part of a neural theory of consciousness is you've got to be explained, well, why do some things seem red? Why do other things seem loud? Why do other things uh, uh, involve pain? Well, all of these things are different kinds of neural processes because of these properties of semantic pointers that I call modal retention. Um, so that's a big part of it. You've got to have these representations that can hang on to aspects of the sensory experience that caused them in the first place. Well, that's part of it. But the other part of it that's really important is ideas of competition. So consciousness is very limited. You got 86 billion neurons going on in your brain. And so that means you've got billions of neural groups operating in your brain at any given time. But almost all of that's unconscious. Why right now am I unconscious am I conscious of the computer screen in front of me? Well, because it's got my attention. But that could change really quickly. If a bird suddenly crashed on my window, my attention would leave you in the computer screen and would go right to the window to see if anything had happened there. So attention is competitive. But how does that work? Well, in my theory of consciousness, it's by competition between semantic pointers. So at any given time, you can have these billions of, of neural representations occurring. Some of them are semantic pointers, which are more complicated representations formed by combinations. But these semantic pointers compete with each other to get access to consciousness. And consciousness 
is, has limitations because it can only happen through particular kinds of representations or in particular, particular parts of the brain. Not just one place, but, but there's a number of different places where this kind of competition goes on. So the idea is we're conscious and we have these different experiences as a result of competition among the semantic pointers, which are neural representations, which carry forward the sensory experiences that help to form them. That's really interesting. So it's not then a, like, so it's not then just a matter of complexity. Like IIT, for example, just sees consciousness as a level of, some level of complexity of integrated information. No, no, I don't, no, no, I think that's, uh, the, the information integration technology is, well, it, it's got a bunch of problems. First of all, it doesn't have a coherent account of what information integration is. When I talk about informa information integration, I mean, you've got one neural representation, say for red, and a neural, another neural representation, say for shirt, and you integrate them together. And the semantic pointers show how that works. Information integration in Tononi's theory is a mathematical abstraction that is in fact computationally intractable because it requires computing all the subsets, uh, all, the, all the set of subsets, and that's an exponentially increasingly large number. So that's just simply computationally uh, incoherent in any real life situation. So no, I think that's that's a non-starter as a neural theory, even though that's probably the most popular neural theory right now. I think it's just a, a really bad theory, both for internal reasons and also external reasons, as it doesn't explain why there are all these different sensory experiences. So with my Sepanic pointer competition theory, I can explain why there are these different conscious experiences, why they get more and more complex, right up to the level of cringing, because semantic pointers get more and more complex because they get bound together into more complicated ones. So I haven't done this yet, but my aim is to have a theory of cringing that can handle all these things because the, the uh, information integration theory can't handle it. The other popular neural theory right now is uh, Stanislas de Haines broadcast theory, which actually I think is probably a component of what goes on, but it, it, it can't explain the difference in different kinds of conscious experiences either. He says, well, we don't deal with that, but that means he's got a bad theory of consciousness. So I think these are the, the three best neural theories of consciousness right now. And I think I can make a case that mine is the best. I actually do this in the consciousness chapter of my balance book, where I argue that you can integrate the useful aspects of information integration and consciousness broadcasting into my semantic pointer theory view, into what I think is now the best theory. Is it the final theory? No. I, mean, we're, I think we're, we're sort of in the early stages of this in the same way that Galileo and Newton were just starting to figure out how physics works. So it's going to be hundreds of years before this is sorted out forward. But I think there's, there's real progress now. And we certainly have reason to believe that this neural approach to consciousness is way better than the alternatives out there, such as dualism and idealism and panpsychism. Yeah, I mean, to a naturalist, those aren't even starters. Well, panpsychism is naturalistic. It's just a bad naturalistic theory. So panpsychism says, yeah, rocks are conscious, so that's okay. And, and eventually humans just get more of it. Well, I don't think that rocks are conscious uh, and trees aren't conscious either, but there are lots of organisms with neurons are that you can figure out how it works by figuring out how the neurons have these mechanisms that have consciousness as an emergent property. Do you think there's a bit of a disconnect between people like yourself who are creating a computationally plausible theory uh, versus looking for neural correlates, that there's a difference in approach right now? Well, neural correlates were a really important idea back in the 80s when brain scanning started because uh, so little was known about the brain. When I got into cognitive science in the late 70s, I, was, I, I looked at... Picture, I, I suppose the brain seemed completely irrelevant to anything that I was concerned about, such as high level thinking. But uh, that changed. And the first thing that changed it was better techniques for measuring what goes on in brains. So it used to be that to measure what goes on in brains, you have to do what uh, Wilder Penfield did and open up the brain and stick electrodes in. They did it back in the 30s, but you can't do that all the time. Whereas once machines came available for scanning brains, then suddenly, vast amounts of information could be acquired. So that was a big, big step forward in, in, in the 80s. So suddenly more was knowing about. And that meshed very nicely with new, new neural network models. So at that point, it started to make sense to talk about, um, well, so, sorry, to go back to the brain scans. The brain scans 
naturally suggested look for neural correlates because you could say right now that person is afraid. Uh, we know by their facial expressions and their self-reports that they're afraid. And we can see that there's a lot of neurons firing in their amygdala. So the amygdala is a neural correlate fear. That just was really good. But I think it's really sad that people still talk that way. Because once neural networks, I, the idea of computational neural networks developed, and especially once theoretical neuroscience took off over the last 20 years, we don't just have to think about the neural correlates. That's just a start. That's just an observation. We can explain the neural correlates by describing the neural mechanisms. Right. And that's what theoretical neuroscience does. That's what uh, Chris Elias Smith's approach and some other approaches in theoretical neuroscience I think are doing really well. We're describing the mechanisms that are responsible for the correlates. And on the other end, the philosophical end, do you think the, the hard problem or asking what it is like to be a bat, um, do you think those are those are roadblocks right now? Well, they could provide a start because I don't want to give up on conscious experience. I, I, I criticize Dehane because he says, well, we don't do experiments. We strike, so we wouldn't do experiments, we do broadcasting. And Tononi claims to be explaining experience, but he doesn't even begin to do it because he doesn't indicate how his mathematically intractable processes could generate different kinds of experiences. But I think to try to have a theory of consciousness doesn't explain experiences is like, Having a theory yeah. of a, just disease that doesn't explain why you get a fever. It's absolutely crucial to it. So we want to explain that. And we take it as a fact to be explained. The idea of the hard problem or what is what it's like is a way to argue that this can't be done. It's really a way of defending either dualism or some kind of, of uh, impossibility thesis. Uh, and I think that's wrong because we're making progress on it. I think there's a, there's a recent book uh, by a neuroscientist where he introduces a nice phrase, which I like, uh, the real problem of consciousness. The real problem of consciousness is to identify the mechanisms that are responsible for conscious experiences. Not just the neural correlates, correlates but the mechanisms that are responsible. And that's, that's happening now. I think I've made real progress, for example, in explaining the different conscious experiences that are involved with emotions for why you're happy or why you're sad. And I'm trying to work up to cringing. <laughs> so, but, that, but, neuro, that, but this can be done. And once you've done that, then you've solved the real problem of consciousness and the idea of, of what it's like drops out. I mean, that, that's, that's really kind of dumb if you think about it. There's not one thing that it's like to be conscious. There's many things. There are our external sensations like seeing and hearing. There's our, our internal sensations like our balance and our our pain and our heat. There's the hundreds of emotions I've already mentioned, and there's even the abstract things like talking about consciousness. Well, these are all real conscious experiences, and you need to have a theory that can explain all of them. It's not one thing that it's like, it's there's millions of things that it's like, and a conscious, a real solution to the problem of consciousness will explain all of them. And now I think that's coming into view. It's coming into view thanks to ideas like Semantic pointers and competition among neural representations. So I think it's really exciting. These these are all possibilities that uh, are going to take probably not decades, probably centuries to work out. But you can see you can see um, you can see who where where the growth is. Um, Emery Lakatosh was a philosopher of science who distinguished between degenerating research programs and progressive research programs. The the dual the dualist hard problem, what it's like, hasn't progressed at all in the last three decades. Whereas the research program that looks for neural mechanisms has been a wonderfully progressive research program, and I think will continue to be so. Yeah, I, I, I read about, you know, like you came up with the criteria for demarcation, right? Like what is plausible science and what isn't? And it was along those lines, things that, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but things that do actually make progress and the community of people who work on it can see that they make progress. Yeah, there are other conditions that go into it as well, such as the ability to take into account uh, in, in increasing amounts of empirical evidence. But yeah, that's part of it. Uh, if you look at pseudosciences like astrology, it's no different than it was 2000 years ago. But if you look at astronomy, the advances have been astonishing. So I think the same thing operates here with these studies of consciousness. No progress at all in dualism, but dramatic progress in neural explanations of consciousness.
I felt that a bit of cognitive science kind of progresses without dealing with the the question of consciousness. Um, do you think that's sort of a mistake? That well, no, th- there were two good reasons for that. I mean, first of all, any science when it starts out has to deal with the the simpler kinds of things. So, if you go back to cognitive science got started in the fifties. In the fifties, the dominant view in most of the world in psychology was behaviorism which basically said, forget about the mind, just look at behavior. This was disastrous and couldn't even explain the behavior of rats, let alone the thoughts of human beings. So that got replaced in the 50s because developments in psychology and linguistics and in and computers provide different ways of explaining how the mind works. But then people set out to explain things that were, seemed a little bit simpler, such as uh, decision making or making inferences or, or making memories. So I think it was completely legitimate that in those early days, people didn't worry much about consciousness. Part of that was illegitimate because the behaviorists had made that studies like consciousness seem scientifically illegitimate. But some of it is just trying to deal initially with the more, more accessible phenomena. Um, so it took a while before it became both possible and desirable for psychologists to investigate consciousness. And the same problem was in neuroscience. Neuroscience was trying to figure out basic things like, well, what are the neural correlates of fear? They weren't in any position to start thinking about what conscious experiences are. What changed that really was Francis Crick, the co-discoverer of DNA. He's the one who made it respectable for the first time for neuroscientists to talk about consciousness and not seem like uh, like they were just being wild speculators. So that was a good change. And so it took decades of developments in psychology and neuroscience for consciousness to become on the table. But really for the last 20 years or so, it has been on the table. And that's where some really useful ideas, some concerned with attention, some ideas with neural representation have become available. So it took a long time for consciousness to really come on the agenda, but it's certainly on the agenda now. There's lots of new work coming in all the time. And the prospects for dramatic progress on the real problem of consciousness are immense. Do you think there's been, do you think that there's been a, like some people talk about the second revolution in cognitive science or after, with embodiment for a cognition. What are your thoughts about that? That wasn't a revolution in cognitive science. That's, that's just hype. Um, embodiment's a really important idea. Uh, so actually it took me a while to catch on to how important it is, but I got, it was really empirical evidence that did it. The sort of abstract arguments about going back to Heidegger didn't convince me at all. When I saw the work of people by people like... Um, um, Rolla uh, Thompson Roche? Oh, that was, no, that was a little earlier. No, by people like Larry Barcelo, oh. working on physical sim- symbol systems, and work on emotions by people like Damasio, indicating the role of the body in what he called uh, semantic markers. And so it... By that time, it became started to become clear that embodiment is an important part of human thinking, not because of, for Heideggerian reasons, which are anti-representational, but because the representations that operate in the brain are in fact heavily affected by the body. So uh, your sensory experiences are an important part, your bodily experiences, I just wrote a book about balance, which of course is heavily embodied because you're getting all these signals from your ears, uh, your inner ears, and from your and from all your limbs, and it's all obviously embodied. Um, but the mistake that's made by the people who call themselves what is it, the four E approach, they claim to be doing something revolutionary. They're not. They're they're basically a, it's a counter revolution. They're trying to go back to behaviorism, to go back away from the idea of representation. So what's good about what they do is to point out that embodiment is a big contributor to representations, but then you still have to combine it with other things. And the power of the human brain comes not just from the body, although that's a part of it, it comes from being able to go beyond the body, to be able to come up with theoretical ideas like viruses and germs and atoms. Uh, so in my book, um, uh, Natural Philosophy, I call this transbodiment. <laughs> that is not because it's spiritual or anything, but it goes beyond the body because we've got this ability to come up with theoretical ideas that go beyond sense experience. The, the hardcore radical embodiment people are basically back to behaviorism because they don't realize that we get these stronger theoretical ideas by combining our initially embodied experiences into theoretical ideas that have far more explanatory power. So 
I'm quite happy to embrace important ideas from that tradition. Embodiment's one, the idea that we're embedded in the world, that, that we don't have to do everything in our heads, we interact with the world. I think that's, that's all, that's, those, are, those are all, those are ideas that all have grains of truth in them, but that should be absorbed into cognitive science and it basically has, rather than considered as an alternative. So it's a general research program. It's not take insights from it where where they're found and and integrate. Yeah, no, I think they haven't succeeded in explaining things that standard cognitive science hasn't. But there has been a useful influence by people realizing uh, that aspects of thought, which include perception and emotion, do have heavily um, embodied inputs. So yeah, so embodiment's important. It's just not the whole story. Otherwise we wouldn't be smarter than cockroaches. Cockroaches are embodied, but they're not very smart. Right. What about extended extended cognition? That I think is more problematic. I think that's mostly rhetoric. Um, so in, my, in one of my books, I call it a deepity. I use Dan Dennett's, uh, <laughs> a, a deepity is something that at first glance seems kind of profound. When you look at it quickly, you realize it's, it's basically either trivial or false. <laughs> so obviously we interact with the world. And so the idea that we're extended by using our cell phones or our computers or our, um, or our golf clubs, oh, sure, that's, that's all true. But it's sometimes passed off as it's some sort of fundamental insight into the mind, and it's not. If you look at how the mind works, it's still much better at understanding our neural processes. So it's ridiculous to say your, your cell phone is important to your thinking, but it's not part of your mind because it's not part of your brain. Your brain is using its capacities to get the information it gets from a cell phone to solve problems. But still, there's a sharp division between the internal neural mechanisms that are doing the work in thinking and all these all of these things in the world, including external devices that are providing its valuable information. So I, I think there are insights into thinking of the mind as embedded and interactive and uh, Inactive. I forget what all the other, oh, in, in, inactive, yeah, concerned with action. Uh, but the, the idea that uh, that it's extended into the world, I think that's just a misleading rhetoric. Yeah, I mean, like, like you said, like there's obviously interaction with the world. I don't know if extended cognition is helpful for thinking about things in the world. Like if you if you want to have a theory of technology, if you want to have a theory of misinformation, I don't know if trying to see all phenomena as inherently cognitive or something like that. I'm sure that's a strong version of it. Well, it's certainly valuable to say that the brain functions by interacting with the world, including devices in the world. But to say that makes those devices part of the brain is just ridiculous. I mean, the, 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 uh, the plant sitting beside you is not part of your brain. Your brain is getting all sorts of information about it, what it looks like and what it feels like and so on, but it has to process that information coming from outside. So it's not that you, your, your, your mind doesn't extend into the world in that way. That's just a, that's just rhetoric. Going back to the demarcation thing, it doesn't, it, you can't make progress pursuing that line of inquiry. Yeah, I think I can't, uh, you know, that's an interesting question. Have, are there any empirical phenomena that have been explained as a result of the embedded mind hypothesis that couldn't have been explained otherwise. I can't think of any. Whereas the extended mind, sorry, the, the embodied mind, yeah, it is important. So if you want to explain balance, or if you want to explain perception, you want to explain emotion, the fact that our bodies are an important part of that, I think that's actually turned out to be a, a progressive research program, uh, as long as it's not taken as ex exclusion to transbodiment. Whereas I can't think of any phenomena that get better understanding as a result of the extended mind idea. Okay. So what what part of cognitive science are you excited for for the future? Oh, all of these. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I've, I've been talking about the things that I work on the most, such as misinformation and consciousness and emotion, but there's just lots of, of areas that, are, that are, are really interesting right now that I don't spend as much time on, but even basic areas like memory, there are advances there, and... Uh, uh, problem solving, decision making, you know, all these, all the, all the standard areas of cognitive science are, are making progress. Language is obviously why has lots of open questions. And so it's great that there are different people in different fields working on these. Uh, so one issue has arisen in cognitive science is maybe cognitive science has failed because 
if you look at it sociologically, if you look at the conferences or the journals, it looks, hey, this is just basically high-level cognitive psychology, people doing experiments. But that's that's basically a bad sample. It looks from these publication sources that they become homes for high-level cognitive psychology. And I guess they needed a high-level cognitive psychology needed such a home. But theoretically, at the theoretical level, cognitive science is flourishing because there are lots of interactions among the fields, including philosophy and psychology and neuroscience and linguistics and anthropology. So lots of flourishing interactions. So I think cognitive science as a general field is doing really well, even though it looks like some of the venues have been taken over just by experiment-based cognitive psychology. Right. What, what, like, where is the disconnect in how people generally think about psychology uh, and, and the revision that cognitive science offers? Well, most people's knowledge of psychology is very limited. They, they think uh, if you study psychology, you're a shrink. I mean, basically, you're a therapist or something like that. And therapy is one important application of psychology. But psychology has always been much broader than that ever since cognitive psychology took off in the 60s. It considers all these really important processes like problem solving and learning and language. And it's very broad. Most people just don't know about that. Most people's idea of psychology is just therapy, which is just one part of it. And it's broader in valuable ways because you want psychology not to give, just to give descriptions. You want it to give explanations. And for explanations, you need mechanisms. And the mechanisms are sometimes computational. And increasingly these days, they're neurocomputational. So psychology has changed dramatically in the decades I've been studying it because now neuroscience isn't just an add-on to it. It's, it's part of it. Every cognitive psychology textbook nowadays and even social psychology textbooks have a lot of the brain in them because that's how the field is developed because you can understand a lot of it, a lot about psychological phenomena by seeing ways in which the brain is producing those phenomena. So in, at the beginning levels, but not even at the beginning levels now, and I, maybe not in intro psychology, but by cognitive psychology and social psychology at the second or third year level, the, the students are already getting a big idea that the brain is a big part of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, from its origin, I think psychology had a problem in trading up between the theoretical aspects and the therapeutic application. Yeah, well, the, 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 the neural aspects, the theoretical aspects are really important for, for the practical applications too. I've got an article coming out in the journal Emotion sometime this year on the neural mechanisms involved in therapy. So therapy is always aimed at emotional change. People go to the therapist because they got emotional problems. It's because they're depressed or they're anxious or have got other kinds of, of problems in thinking, all of which involve emotions in different ways. So what the therapist sets out to do is to change their emotions or to help them change their emotions. So you want people to move from being depressed to at least accepting their lives and, and feeling less hopeless. Or if someone's always anxious, they're feeling fear and you need to have some ways of dealing with the fear. So that all involves emotional change. Well, I've used my new theory of emotions to provide a theory of emotional change, which is going to be changes in the semantic pointer processes. So um, that paper, yeah, that should be out soon. I think it should provide a guidance to people doing therapy to think how it could be done better. What about, um, so things like positive psychology and spiritual practices and things, spiritual practices, in in the context of just considering the mechanism. Uh, what are your thoughts about those? I know that a lot of people do take comfort in spiritual practices because it's nice to think that uh, there's a God who's looking out for you. Uh, what's, what's the saying? God won't give you any problems you can't handle. Well, frankly, it just strikes me as implausible. We've got all sorts of hard problems like the, the pandemic, right? Why, why did this is now getting to the branch of philosophy called theodicy? Why, why did God give us this horrible pandemic? It's no evidence for the existence of God. It's maybe evidence for the existence of the devil, because it's diabolical. Because the virus came along that was both lethal and incredibly infectious. I mean, this, and it's caused dramatic disruption to millions of people in the world, and at least 15 million deaths by usual calculation. So uh, so I, I don't see spiritual 
guidance being any help there at all, except on the matter as a kind of motivated reasoning that people are, find fairly natural. So I don't look for spiritual guidance. So I know a lot of people do, but of course that raises some really interesting questions in cognitive science. There's a field now, a subfield now called the cognitive science of religion. And I immediately, my friend Bob McCauley tried to get me interested and I said, no, I, I'm much more interested in the cognitive science right. of science. And he said, you see, he said, Paul, look, there's only a few million scientists in the world and there's something like 5 billion believers in the world, which is the more important phenomenon. I had to agree that he was right. And so I wrote a little bit about the cognitive science of religion. But so that, I think that's a really interesting question, how religious belief works and, and uh, Bob McCauley and, and lots of other researchers in that field have actually had some really interesting things to say. So I, see, I, I think of spirituality as something more to be explained yep. by cognitive yes. science than something that contributes to cognitive and science. I, I often find that if you understand the mechanism behind a practice, you take a lot out of it. You take a lot more out of it. Like personally, I, I tried meditation for on and off for, for a, number, a couple of times and I never really got anything out of it. But in the past year or so, I read a little bit of the cognitive science and started to somewhat understand the just the cognitive benefits of it. And that really provided a shift. And now I can I meditate somewhat frequently and it, it is kind of helpful, but it's not helpful because of any kind of metaphysical, ontological, spiritual claim. It's helpful because I can understand how to slow my mind down. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's really a case of where embodiment is highly relevant because you control your breathing, you're slowing down the signals being sent by your vagus nerve to the brain. And your brain interprets the, the, the slower breathing as a sign that everything's okay. And so you feel more relaxed and more happy. So I could never do a spiritual type meditation, but I have an Apple Watch that has a breathe. And I, I, used to, I do the five minute breathing exercise in it two or three times a day. And I really like it. Nothing spiritual about it. It's all the neural mechanisms based on vagus nerve. Uh, so it's a good thing. It's, it's, it's embodied, but it's also heavily transbodied because it depends on the mechanisms in the brain as well as what's going on in the body. Right. Okay. One, uh, so sidetrack, one more question about, about naturalism. So I, th I think I'm totally on board with naturalism in the way that you described it. But the one thing that, that does, uh, that, that troubles me is mathematics. We're, what's your stand on math? You're absolutely right that mathematics is a big problem for naturalism. Because to people like Plato and Frege and many subsequent philosophers, it seems like something that just doesn't require anything natural. It doesn't require the body. It's something you do by pure thought. It's something that the mind all by itself seems to do. Uh, the, 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 the beliefs, um, the theorems, the proofs, the mathematical concepts that seem to come out of nothing. Well, I think that's an illusion. So what I argue in the, um, the, toward the end of natural philosophy is for a position developed by an Australian philosopher called Aristotelian realism. And he's, he's got a view, I can't remember his, his name at the moment, but his, his view is that we should think of mathematics as in fact a kind of applied science. It's about things in the world. It's about processes in the world. It's about change. And it's about abstract, it's about abstractions from objects. It's probably a view that might be, yeah, that's well, closer to, to Aristotle than to Plato. Plato thought we needed the abstract ideas or forms to operate on their own, but not for Aristotle and not for uh, this, this view. And what I try to do is show how ways in uh, ways in which cognitive science is developing fit with this more Aristotelian view. And when you start to look in detail at particular areas of mathematics, they start to look not so abstract as you thought. Uh, for example, the metaphor theorist uh, John, uh, George Lakoff wrote a whole book about the metaphors, the embodied metaphors that are behind lots of mathematics. For example, of the number line. Well, we're familiar with lines from things we see in the world. And so you can connect a lot of mathematical ideas with these embodied metaphors that grow out of that. How do we get beyond these embodied ideas? Well, the answer is semantic pointers, because semantic pointers enables us to take neural representations that are based on sensory experiences and build them up into more complicated things. 
And so with semantic pointers, we get neural representations of neural representations of embodied representations. And so we're able to make abstractions away from our senses to get what seem to be these purely abstract ideas of mathematics. So I think that the illusion that the mind, that, that, that mathematics is somehow completely abstract and disembodied is just wrong. And we can see how it's wrong by looking at these processes of embodiment and metaphor and abstraction by means of semantic points. So then, then do we need to figure out the origins of mathematics, like the um, evolutionary origins, or is that just a hopeless lost cause? Well, no, I don't think, it, I think the evolutionary origins are far off. I mean, modern mathematics is really new. It's only a few thousand years old. And so basically there are cultural organizations building on top of our linguistic abilities. There's some mathematical abilities that you find in apes, like the ability to count up to six. But that, I don't think there's anything innate about the ability to do calculus or, or, or abstract geometry. But what was there is the ability to build more and more complicated representations as occurred in language and the mathematics built on top of that capacity to get farther and farther removed from the sensory origins of language. But that was already the truth. We already had concepts of God. You don't get God by abstracting from what you see with your eyes. So humans were already able to do that in linguistic areas. And then they got good at doing that with mathematical abstractions as well. So it's not, it's a, the, the evolution there uses our cognitive processes, but it's basically a cultural process. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, and on the opposite end, uh, ethics isn't quite as mysterious as mathematics is then. Well, it has been to a lot of people because, uh, well, Kant said that we had this moral sense, which was totally mysterious. It was one of the reasons he believed in God, that we, because it, that it had to be God to provide us with a moral sense. But I think we've got a moral sense for much base, for basic reasons. It's partly things we've t talked about already. The fact that we're cooperative as humans, as, as human groups, and the fact that we have emotions, and the fact that we have language to reason about things. So all of these things go together to make for ethical systems. The sense of right and wrong is really important part of being able to emotionally react to the needs of other people in the complex environments in which we which we which we've always been part of so i can give a purely naturalistic account of ethics that allows also for an objective view of right and wrong i think the key to objectivity you know, i develop a lot in the book natural philosophy is ideas about human needs human needs are partly embodied partly psychological and they are objective. These are things that all human beings have, and we should judge our judgments. We should make our judgments about right and wrong based on assessments of the needs of others as well as those of ourselves. And probably the same kind of story with aesthetics. Oh, aesthetics is harder. I try to do that in, um, again, in natural philosophy. I've got a chapter on aesthetics. Um, but there are mostly tie aesthetics into questions of emotions. So I think all aesthetic experience is emotional. And so their naturalistic theories of emotions provide a big part of indicating the basis for aesthetic judgments. Aesthetics is one important application of human thought. I think art and music are, are among the, the most, all, all the arts are among the most valuable things that humans do. And we're not just about technology and science. It really is important for good reasons to people that we have, uh, we have painting and and music and uh, movies and all these other wonderful things that enrich people's lives. So these are all kinds of human thinking. But we, to understand them all, it helps a lot to understand how the mind works because aesthetics isn't done in the abstract. It's not done by souls. It's done by brains. And we can understand aesthetic appreciation as a one kind of uh, emotional as well as cognitive judgment. Okay, two light questions to end it off. Um, one, who, who have been some of your favorite philosophers to read? Well, I think the earliest influence on me that was really large was Charles Peirce. So I mentioned getting the idea of abduction from Chomsky, but then of course that led me to Peirce and looking at his ideas about reasoning was really important. So when I was a graduate student at the University of Toronto, I took a really good course on Peirce. And so I think probably, 
in my early days, especially, purse was the major influence. And any advice for young people? Uh, well, think. <laughs> uh, no, there's. It's. I think being a young person today is not easy. And there's just so many big, big worries um, to operate with from pandemics and climate change and autocratic leaders and could bring us into a nuclear war. So that's really difficult. Um, but the, the advice to think is really the advice to think broadly. So I think people are worried about these issues, and, and they should be, as well as the better parts of life, like love, work, and play, should realize that you need to not just think in one way. Thinking philosophically is really valuable because it provides these ways of dealing with generality and normativity that I think are really important. But they also need to be well informed about developments in the world in both the social sciences and the natural sciences. So think broadly is my best advice.